feeling sold out even though I'm keeping strong But can I hold out when every bit of freedom's gone? They want me rolled out, never to sing freedom song I wanna see the sky, I wanna feel the rain But gotta keep away from windows, that's some window pane It's just a shame, couldn't have planned out all our dreams Now I scream Cause there's a man in the machine But the train is off the tracks And damn it's losing steam I wanna call Christine I haven't seen since 013 I'm missing life Like three strikes each night Seems like three nights Ain't right Can't fight Space light Hate light Wanting to be snake light Shedding off this gray life In the dark can't make light But where I'm headed now is brake lights Where I'm headed now they break lights Counting days like Break lights, feeling weight like break lights. Had a great life. Break lights, break lights, break lights. Out of place like break lights. In my face like break lights. Counting days like break lights, break lights, break lights. Sit here asking what have I done? If the strings were cut, I'd see my son. And if I could just fly from this place, then I'd hold you in my love embrace. And if I could just speak to you now, I'd renew my vow and be in the now.
Welcome to the 13th Unity for J Vigil for WikiLeaks publisher, Julian Assange. I'm Joe Loria, the editor-in-chief of Consortium News. We have a great lineup of guests tonight. But before that, we want to get some of the headlines. And for some people who are new to our vigil, I just want to explain who Julian Assange is. He's a wanted man, and he's wanted because he's published over the years classified information that reveal crimes and corruption of government officials around the world, not just in the United States, but it's in the U.S., so-called beacon of freedom that's spreading democracy and f press freedom, that has indicted him and wants him extradited to the U.S. for the crime of publishing. That's why Julian is uh, still inside the as a refugee in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for the past six years. He knows that the moment he steps outside onto British territory, the British police will give him a warm welcome in the words of the foreign secretary, which means his arrest an extradition to the United States, perhaps not even going before a judge, going right into a court to the airport and to the U.S., where a courtroom number 700 in Alexandria, not far from where I'm sitting right now, uh, is waiting for him, where he probably won't get a fair trial and will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. That's why we have these vigils. So I'm going to look at some of the headlines since last week's uh, show, we uh, gathered together some developments in the past seven days. Uh, first, WikiLeaks has raised the $50,000 that it was seeking online to sue the Guardian newspaper in Britain over the story published uh, in December, I believe, of last year about uh, by Luke Harding, who we've given a sound tr trashing to here on this show, and I think that will continue today, for a story that Harding and two other reporters uh, published saying that Paul Manafort had three times visited a Julian Assange inside that embassy in London, the Ecuadorian embassy, and that one of the last time was in 2016, around the time that uh, Manafort became briefly Donald Trump's campaign manager. The article also mentions that, just mentions one line that some Russians had also visited him. Now, we don't know whether these are Russian uh, cleaners that clean the embassy or uh, emissaries. This absolute rubbish to say that without backing it up. The article had no evidence whatsoever. And as many people pointed out, Craig Murray being amongst the first, that the embassy is, is bathed in surveillance cameras. Uh, it is one of the most surveilled places in one of the most surveilled cities on earth, London. And there would certainly be photographic evidence of Paul Manafort coming in. There were police stationed outside the embassy at that time for the early visits. They've been withdrawn subsequently. Anyone who visits that embassy to see Julian Assange or anyone has to sign in at the front desk, leave their passport, their cell phone. Uh, there's, there's no way that Paul Manafort would have gotten in there without evading all of that. And since uh, that evidence was never produced in the Guardian story, it's a very likely possibility that that story is fabrication. That's indeed what John Pilger reported to us when I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago after he had just seen Julian Assange inside the embassy and they discussed the Guardian story at length, he told me, and they concluded, of course, that it was an absolute fabrication because Julian Assange knows who he meets and who he hasn't met. And Paul Manafort was not one of them. Interestingly, that story had only two bylines online, but on in the print edition, there were three bylines. Uh, and the third, which did not appear online, the third, which of course is a permanent record online, whereas uh, the, the print edition of the garden winds up wrapped around fi fish and chips or, or worse in, in London. So Fernando Valenciencio, Fernando Valenciencio is the third byline on that story. Now who is Fernando Valenciencio? He's now been exposed as um, a guy who calls himself a journalist running an investigative journalism site in Ecuador, but it's now been shown, and Ben Norton, the journalist, is the one who first reported on this. He has received a $65,000 grant from the National Endowment for Democracy. Everybody on my panel here knows what the National Endowment for Democracy is. It's... Um, it's, it's national and some kind of endowment, but I think it has little to do with democracy. It, of course, has been the arm of uh, U.S. government to try to foster uprisings around the world. In fact, um, Washington Post journalist who is 
very close to the CIA, his name is escaped me, but you guys are going to tell me right now, wrote a piece back in 1980 in which he said that the NED this was now doing what the CIA used to do covertly. They're doing openly, which was to foment rebellion against uh, nations in the Soviet sphere at that time. Um, so it's openly known that that's what the NED does. And they paid this guy, Fernando Valenciencio, 65 grand to promote anti-Korea, anti-Korea propaganda on that website. Korea being, of course, the previous, Rafael Correa being the previous Ecuadorian government, uh, president, rather, who gave exile to Julian Assange. The new government wants him out and has been doing everything they can to get him out, uh, reducing heat, making it even hard to get food at times, uh, limiting his visitors, uh, cutting off his access to the world through the internet, Nothing is moving, Julian Assange. He's staying put. Now, interestingly enough, the AFP reported that U.S. investigators will, uh, today it was supposedly, uh, Friday, today, this was a report today, begin to question diplomatic staff who were stationed at the Ecuadorian embassy in London during WikiLeaks found Assange's years-long stay about his visitors. Uh, this was released information by WikiLeaks. And AFP reports that this follows international subpoenas from the U.S. Department of Justice, which is probing the re a report that President Donald Trump's disgraced former 2016 campaign chairman Paul Manafort had secret talks there with Assange. That's the Guardian story. That led, as you might recall, some members of Congress to call for, for that to be investigated. So that wasn't just some idle report on the front page of the Guardian that has never been proven and that the Guardian editors have been totally silent about ever since, despite demands to produce evidence. So the Justice Department wants to talk to six staff members from the Ecuadorian embassy, and we'll start to interview them today in Quito. They're in Quito now. Uh, this is what this AFP report says. Um, then the, the AFP report talks about the Guardian story. Uh, it says the period uh, in which he supposedly met uh, Assange was a time when he became a key figure uh, for the, in the Trump campaign. And it preceded the publishing of WikiLeaks thousands of emails allegedly stolen, at least AFP is putting allegedly in here, by Russian hackers. So this Guardian story has led to this now. U.S. Department of Justice is interviewing members of the Ecuadorian embassy to see if, in fact, Manafort went there. That will be a very interesting uh, development. If we don't hear anything about this, I suspect that the Justice Department came up with nothing, and they all said they've never saw Manafort. Uh, that's the way they'd probably handle that in the media. We just won't hear about it again. And some other news, uh, perhaps less important, but uh, encouraging nonetheless, is that Assange treatment was debated in the Bundestag in Germany this week. Um, there's some video online of that, of that debate that follows a visit to Julian Assange at the end of last year by three members of the Bundestag. Uh, and then uh, shortly after a statement released by the 50 EU uh, members of parliament and members of the European parliament, support of Julian Assange. That was followed again by Australian, former Australian ambassador Tony Kevin backing Assange. And then we had that statement that has gone totally silent since by Giuliani on Fox News, uh, in which he said that Julian, that Julian Assange had committed no crimes. And he compared WikiLeaks publications to the Pentagon Papers. And he pointed out that no one from the Washington Post or the New York Times went to jail for publishing the Pentagon Papers, and nor should Julian Assange. That did not get any kind of traction. And we don't know at all whether, uh, of course, whether Giuliani has talked to Trump about this. That is would have been the significance of that story. Trump is in a position to give a pardon, which would have all kinds of political partisan consequences, of course, which may be why uh, Trump may be holding back. We're just speculating here. Human Rights Watch this week said, quote, the United Kingdom must reject the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States. They've made statements before, but it's good to have another one. Now, this notice is quite interesting. It comes from our friend Sam Husseini, who has appeared on these vigils. He's he, In writing for, his, for the Institute for Public Accuracy, for which he works, he wrote, quote, at confirmation hearings this Tuesday uh, in the U.S. for the new uh, nominee for uh, Attorney General, Senator Amy Klobuchar asked Attorney General nominee William Barr, quote, will the Justice Department jail reporters for doing their jobs? Now, Julian Assange's name did not come up here, but it was hanging there in the air. What was his answer to the question, will the Justice Department jail reporters for doing their jobs? Barr responded, quote, 
I think that, you know, I know there are guidelines in place and I can conceive of situations where, you know, as a last resort and where a news organization has run through a red flag or something like that, knows that they're putting out stuff that will hurt the country. There could be a situation where someone could be held in contempt. Chilling statement from a man who might very well become the next Attorney General of the United States. Now, Floyd Abrams, the author of uh, one of the big First Amendment lawyers in the United States, he provided Sam uh, Husseini uh, at the Institute of Public Action with a statement. And Floyd Abrams said, it's one thing to say that there could be circumstances in which a journalist's need to protect her sources could lead to a potential finding of contempt of court if she refused to obey a court order requiring such disclosure. But the notion that a journalist could probably properly be jailed for publishing material that the government thinks could, quote, hurt the country, unquote, is something else entirely and would be deeply threatening to the First Amendment norms in general and journalistic freedom in particular. Now, Abrams was the litigator on behalf of the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. And in that case, Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Times and the Post, ruling that the government, in that case, the Justice Department of Richard Nixon, could not exercise prior restraint on a publisher. However, the majority opinion did hold that after publication, the government could prosecute publication of classified information, something that no administration has done, going back to the beginning of the Espionage Act because of the political consequences of it disturbing the norms of the First Amendment, if not uh, even even though it might be legal under the odious Espionage Act to prosecute someone for publication afterwards. So on that basis, this government, the Trump administration, as anti-media as they are and as radical in so many ways as it is, could in fact be the first to act on the Espionage Act to ap apprehend a publisher for merely possession and dissemination of classified material. With that, I'm going to introduce our first guests here. Um, well. We have David Swanson. Can I bring David in first? Because you haven't been on for a while, David. I've, I think you've been on a vigil before. Tell us a little bit about what you do and why you're interested and in here. Why are you here defending WikiLeaks? And then we'll talk about with the others some of these uh, and your own views and some of the things I, I've just outlined. And welcome. Uh, yeah, well, I'm a, a supporter of WikiLeaks and of Julian Assange's right to freedom. Uh, I'm here in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States. I'm the director of an organization called World Beyond War, campaign coordinator of an organization called RootsAction.org. I'm an author of books and articles and, and so forth. And uh, I, I, what I oppose, what I spend my days trying to stop the United States government in particular and other governments from doing uh, is all done as a last resort. 67% uh, of the federal discretionary budget in the United States goes to war, goes to militarism, and, and every speck of it is done as a supposed last resort. Uh, so this is a, a meaningless and dangerous phrase, as is, of course, what hurts the country. I mean, there, there's no definition, there's no agreement on what hurts a country uh, and for people to be prosecuted for journalism on that basis uh, in violation of the of the obvious facts blurted out by Giuliani uh, is incredibly frightening. I don't care if you agree with Julian Assange on anything. Uh, you know, this is this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, and uh, as someone who who appreciates is incredibly grateful for what WikiLeaks has informed the world about. Uh, you know, I, I have double the reason to be worried about that sort of threat, but it, it really ought not to matter uh, whether you like what WikiLeaks has done or not. Uh, this is threatening uh, the, the, the institution of, of journalism. Uh, and I, I continue to believe that the U.S. government should be thanking WikiLeaks for the service of informing the U.S. public what the Democratic Party was up to. We're supposed to know. This is, you know, this is what actual democracy involves uh, and should be apologizing to the Russian government for blaming it without any proof that it was it that provided this service to the U.S. public. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm also interested, tell me when to shut up, but I'm, I'm also interested in, in the fact that you mentioned this court in Alexandria because it is about the least likely place in the world, perhaps outside of, uh, of an Israeli court for a Palestinian activist, that anybody's going to find justice for anything. Uh, and I sat through part of a trial of a uh, so-called trial of Jeffrey Sterling, uh, a guy from the CIA who was blamed, again, for providing the service of informing the U.S. public uh, that the CIA had been giving nuclear weapons parts, diagrams, plans uh, to Iran. Uh, you would think that something that insane, uh, the U.S. public ought to know uh, that its government was doing. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, when Jeffrey Sterling did, as he admits to, inform the Congress, go through the proper channels and so forth, Congress didn't do a damn thing. Uh, when somebody informed a journalist who informed the public, uh, Jeffrey Sterling was put through a mockery of a trial uh, with Condoleezza Rice and the rest of them coming in uh, and very ineptly revealing new information that they, that they would have prosecuted anybody else for revealing in the course of the trial. So we can hope for that silver lining in future trials in that court, but sending a man to prison for providing a public service as a whistleblower. And of course, this is, this is, you know, the other part of the, of, of what they're after in going after journalists. They want to go after their whistleblowers too, uh, their sources too. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that they're going to leave Julian Assange alone for the simple reason that that Russia Gate has largely drifted so far afield. Uh, that most of it has to do with, you know, Facebook ads and all this nonsense. And the question of of who gave the information to WikiLeaks has largely been dropped. Um, but I don't think we can can rely on that. Uh, I think. Those of us who who appreciate what WikiLeaks has done uh, and uh, want to stand up for the rights of, of every journalistic uh, institution and individual uh, need to increase our vigilance now, not to not let it slide. You said that um, you know that who how WikiLeaks got the documents is not is not so important anymore. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, they've never interviewed anybody from WikiLeaks, uh, Mueller's people, including Julian Assange. When they can get him, they know where he is, so he's not going anywhere. Uh, they're not interested in that aspect. Have you also raised an interesting question about um, the defense uh, in that courtroom? Uh, because unlike the UK, where there is a thing called the public interest defense, even a newspaper who publishes classified information could argue that was revealed for the interests of the public. You're not allowed to do that in the US. We had a Daniel Ellsberg on here a couple of weeks ago, and he was explaining how he was on this. When he was on the stand, he tried to give the motive for why he did it. His lawyer asked him under examination, and the judge immediately stopped him from doing that. I've seen that myself in other trials of so-called national security. So that would likely happen, of course, would happen in the case if Julian ever took the stand. He wouldn't be able to explain that. And that takes away the whole, any possibility of a, of a fair trial right there, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not a lawyer and others on this call can can fill you in uh, much better. But I do know that on rare occasions, mostly in decades gone by, uh, activists who have gone and uh, hammered and poured blood on nuclear weapons and otherwise engaged in actual and symbolic sabotage of of militarism have been permitted by the court to use that defense and the results have been dramatic and, and to the benefit of those activists. But on many occasions and increasingly, as far as I understand, uh, that defense is denied uh, and almost certainly would be denied to Julian Assange anywhere in the United States and to anyone uh, in that court in Alexandria. No, it's interesting because I was thinking of a very trial that I uh, covered back in the early 90s up near in a place called Rome, New York, where indeed activists went into an Air Force base there and poured blood on B-52s and hammered it. And I was in the courtroom and the judge would not allow them to give any defense of life, any motive. Uh, and they were oh. convicted. So uh, that's good to hear that it has happened before. You also just wanted to talk before we bring in uh, our next guest and we hope you stick around or take part in the discussion is that when you talked about the country, about it's not good for the country, it could hurt the country. What is the definition of, of the country, you think, 
that bar, this attorney general nominee, mean? is the country the public, as you mentioned, or a few people who are a lot of power whose interests will be hurt? I think that's what he means by the country, the rulers of the country, right? <laughs> I think the best government speak, the best propaganda uh, is always ambiguous uh, so that it can mean one thing and be taken to mean something else. Uh, you know, support the troops means bomb a foreign country, uh, hurt the country. Uh, is supposed to be heard by viewers as meaning hurt them. Uh, right. If it actually means anything at all, it means hurt the interests of the people making the decision, uh, those right. prosecutors, those courts. Uh, and so it is, it, it, it is good as propaganda. It is extremely dangerous as public policy. The very people that Julian Assange has uh, revealed secrets about, which is why they want a personal revenge against him. Let's bring in Kevin Zeese. Kevin is also a longtime activist. Tell us your first involvement with WikiLeaks and uh, anything else you want to comment on that uh, was mentioned at the top here. Thanks. First off, let me let me thank you, uh, Joe and Consortium News, for doing this. I wish it's more for Jay as well at organizers. Just want to interrupt. Susie Dawson's Unity for Jay. I've just taken it over recently, but thank you. I know anyway. Susie, Susie's done fantastic work in this and deserve, I've thanked her before, but uh, I just, on, on the air, I wanted to say thank you to Consortium News. This is what media should be doing about the persecution of Julian Assange. Uh, it's amazing that an uh, outlet like The Guardian that profited from WikiLeaks releases uh, is now helping to persecute Julian Assange uh, rather than standing up for his defense. Uh, I've been a political activist since law school. I graduated from George Washington in 1980. I practiced law briefly in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, I've been involved from the beginning, really, since 1980 in fighting for uh, justice. I uh, started with the end of the drug war. And I got involved in the issue of WikiLeaks in this century, when, almost when they started publishing, uh, because I was working on anti-war work and their releases on the Iraq war, on the Afghanistan war, on Guantanamo, on the State Department cables, were all so relevant to our work to try to get the truth out because every political movement begins with education, begins with getting the truth out. And we get so many lies from our mass media that we need an antidote. And uh, WikiLeaks provides that antidote. Uh, I got involved uh, with the Chelsea Manning case, uh, became a member of their steering committee uh, for the Chelsea Manning Support Network early on and have followed that case, followed that case through and organized lots of events and protests, uh, got people helping to get people out the courtroom to monitor that trial. Uh, and, you know, the more you saw in that case, the more important WikiLeaks became as well. I'm also on the advisory board of the Courage Foundation, which was set up by WikiLeaks to, uh, you know, protect whistleblowers, including Julian Assange. My sense of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks is this is a breakthrough media effort. It really democratizes the media in ways that are urgently needed. Rather than a corporate media outlet controlled by its advertisers, its board members, which are also often from corporations, its investors, often from big corporations, and it, with close ties to the government and sometimes kowtowing to the government on what they will talk about and publish, WikiLeaks is the opposite. It's democratized. It gives people in government, uh, people in corporations, uh, the tools to expose the truth. And that is very frightening. That's such a loss of control uh, for the uh, government over the media, to actually have people able to leak the truth anonymously from the Pentagon, uh, from NSA, from the CIA, from uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, and from big corporations, uh, is just like an astounding, transformative process that it immediately scared uh, the power structure. And particularly when the materials leaked by Chelsea Manning exposed the day-to-day -day workings of the Iraq war, raw material, raw intelligence material, showing what was happening on a daily basis, videos showing uh, that were taken by people uh, in the military, showing what they were doing, 
uh, wow, that is a mind blower. And I have, I have no doubt that when the history of this century is written, uh, historians will go back through those WikiLeaks uh, releases and will develop a history about the reality of these never-ending wars, this mass intelligence gathering, this corporate control of U.S. foreign policy, and put together amazingly honest histories about what we're living through now and what so many people don't really know as going on. So I see the persecution of uh, Julian Assange uh, as... uh, defining the First Amendment for now and the future. And if, if he is prosecuted, I hope he is not prosecuted, that case will be equivalent of the John Peter Zenger case. The Zenger case helped to create the First Amendment, uh, and I suspect that if Julian is prosecuted, no matter how it turns out, that will help to define free speech for the remainder of this century and beyond. It will be a breakthrough moment in what we, it will show us we need stronger free speech, uh, free uh, pr- pr- protections of the media uh, than we currently have because a case like Assange's case should not be even happening. He should not be having to hide in an embassy in London <laughs> and being threatened and being blocked from communicating with people. Uh, and so, I, again, I think what Consortium News is doing, what these, what these vigils are doing are so important uh, because it sets the table uh, for where we're going to have to go with this Assange case. And people should know that it's going to take a movement to protect Julian Assange. It's not going to happen without people power standing up for him because the power structure is opposed to him. And that's why there's been such an effort at character assassination. Uh, to make Julian Assange someone you're not allowed to like, uh, to make him into a sex, a sex abuser, make him into a, a Trump fan. Uh, all this character assassination has been intentionally done to prevent a moving movement from growing uh, to support who I think is the most important uh, journalist of the 21st century because he's broken through and democratized the media. I'll stop there. Well, I, I don't think there's any hyperbole in what you've said in pointing out that this is truly an historic press freedom case that is right up there with John Peter Zenger, which was in colonial America. That's right. The British, British governor of New York prosecuted him for writing something that he didn't like about himself. And the, ju- the jury nullified the case. They, they recognized that the law at the time allowed the governor general to prosecute a printer, in that case, of printing some something against the government, but they said they didn't agree with the law. And that was the foundation later for our press freedoms. And now maybe we've come full circle in the Julian Assange case. He would be probably the first, would be the first major case that we know of anyway, of a journalist being prosecuted in North America since John Peter Zenger. That was 300 years ago. That's um, right. And, Z- and that's Zenger's video. defense Zeng- Zenger's defense was he published the truth. Yep. And that, that's that was right. actually, and that was not even allowed as a defense in those days. Correct. If you were saying something bad about the government, about the king, you matter. were guilty. It didn't right. matter. And so that just was a, and that's a kind of what Bob Barr just said, you know, in his testimony. If it's not good for the government, we're going to prosecute him. Well, that's exactly what the Zenger case was about. So it's a reversal of 300 years of press freedom. One uh, of the three, reasons for the revolution is exactly. reversing, reversing exactly. it, going back to colonial British. Uh, thinking, government thinking. Now, Zenger was lucky to be able to get a jury that would nullify. That's a rarity. Uh, jury nullification is, you know, jurors are not instructed on their right to say the law is wrong. Uh, they're instructed to follow the facts as presented in court. And as we talked about, you talked about earlier with David, often the, the reason someone does something is not allowed in that evidence. But jury nullification is not common. And I can tell you, in Alexandria, Virginia, where this case would likely be prosecuted, the jury would be made up of people who work at the Pentagon, their spouses, their children, their friends, people who work for military contractors, work for intelligence agencies, their spouses and children's friends. This will not be a jury that's likely to nullify. And so that, that Alexandria court is used for these kinds of cases 
for a reason because it almost guarantees a conviction. There's no way that Assange would get a fair trial uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, in that Fourth Circuit uh, in Virginia. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you talked about the media. Why uh, is the corporate media opposed to him so strongly now when, A, they did profit by getting scoops from him? It, it helped their profits in terms of money as well. And as uh, Ray McGovern, who we're going to talk to in a minute, uh, wrote from uh, our publication about a speech that the new, number two general counsel of the New York Times gave out to some judges on the West Coast a couple months ago, in which he said, we don't like Assange or we don't want to prosecute him because if they go after him, they can go after us because we're doing the same thing he does, which is to publish classified information. I'll and tell you why, why they don't like I'll, I'll tell you why they don't like him. There's a fight going on right now in the media between the corporate media, which is losing credibility. People don't trust it. The polls show it's just not trusted. And the independent people's media. And that's growing in popularity. People trust their friends. They trust people like Ray McGovern and Bill Benny and others who you know, are truth tellers, uh, but don't get covered in the media, the corporate media. And, and that battle between the corporate media and the people's media, Julian Assange is right in the center of that because he's empowering the people's media. He's empowering a democratized media. And the corporate media is threatened. Uh, the newspaper readership is down. Cable TV news media down. They're not being watched. They're not being believed. And something like WikiLeaks empowers people like us who, you know, our, our website, popularresistance.org, covers the movement, the people's movement on a variety of fronts that the media doesn't cover. And so someone like uh, Julian Assange empowers all of us, empowers consortium news, because they are, that is an avenue for democratized media, for people's media, and the commercial media is very afraid of that. Absolutely. Um, they, uh, and the government, again, previously was afraid to prosecute. Uh, the Obama administration called it, they wanted to go after Assange. They looked into it. They called it their New York Times problem. They knew right. that if they prosecuted WikiLeaks, the Times could be lively prosecuted. I see Sam Hussein is about to join us, and he could talk more about that bar, but he's not online yet. So let me bring in Bill Binney, if you don't mind, Ray. I'll bring Bill in first. Uh, he's, uh, Bill, you take, unmute your microphone, please. Yes. Okay. Bill, of course, was a former national, former technical director of National Security Agency, a very senior official there, and one of the best mathematicians it is said that ever worked at the NSA. Bill, if you want to just weigh in on anything that's been said so far, I'm sure you have something to say. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I just see this whole thing as a as a move by the shadow government of our of our country and the deep state, all of those who have vested interest in perpetual wars and things of that nature trying to get rid of truth uh, across the board so they can spin a narrative and manipulate the people of the country any way they want. <clears throat> Case in point <clears throat> is uh, with, with the, for example, the alleged visit uh, by Manafort into uh, C. Julian. That, that, of course, is just a simple attempt at connecting Julian with the, with the uh, uh, Trump campaign and that in turn with an allegation of being working with the Russians because they fed the, the data into, into Julian. <clears throat> so that would give them grounds for impeaching him and getting rid of him because he is actually a potential disruptor of this entire program that they've been, I call it the happiness management program, where lots of people make lot, lots of money, but, but a lot of the people who are not part of what I call the department of just us meaning there's certain people who are given uh, uh, credit for like, like uh, uh, Hillary when she was excused from all kinds of crimes right? <laughs> because she was Hillary and a, and a member of the Department of Just Us. The rest of us poor suckers are not. We, we just take it in the back side, you know. But uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would point out, though, that there's some things that people here aren't talking about because they're inconvenient, uh, inconvenient regulations in government. For example, uh, if you're talking about uh, whistleblowers, whistleblowers are required by working for the government to report fraud, waste, abuse, and corruption. Now, that's a requirement for them to have employment with the government. But when you do that, then the agencies that they work for come down and, and, and hammer them. 
and, and that's a violation of other regulations covering whistleblower protection, except in the intelligence community. That's where the exceptions are. Uh, but I would also show and say that in the in the, for example, uh, when uh, uh, Edward Snowden published or released all of that material to be published uh, on the spying programs of the NSA, that gave me the opportunity to uh, read into the court record in a sworn affidavit all of those charts and things that uh, that related to a lot of the spying capabilities I and I worked and developed for NSA. Uh, it allowed me to read that into a sworn affidavit, uh, where it's basically swearing that these these uh, agencies are violating the Constitution of the rights of the United States citizens. Uh, and so I did that. And so the government, their their tactic is they've got to keep me out of court and out of testifying, because then it will be uh, on the record and somebody will have to address it. And that's what they don't want to do. They don't want to address all the crimes they've been committing in the public forum. And so. My uh, my uh, objective is to push that, just like Julian does, try to push the truth out, so that so that, you know people in the country have at least some basis of making a some reasonable decision based on knowledge of what's really going on, not not this hidden agenda that the people are spewing up at them. You know, it's like they're treating them like uh, uh, I call it like Pavlov's dogs because they're just repeating things over and over again from many different directions and expecting everybody to believe it without challenging any of it. And that's really where I find the, the objective. Like for example, uh, the allegation that the DNC uh, emails were uh, hacked by somebody in Russia. Well, some of the people who are looking at the data now are finding what what uh, is called FAT, I think FAT32 format, uh, which is a file allocation table format. That's a format used to index data on a storage device, which means and implies that those data, that DNC data was taken down onto a thumb drive or some other quite a storage device that was attached to the computer. So, I mean, you know, that's another fabrication that these people are, are putting forth. I would also argue that in some of the cases like in the Manning case and in the case of uh, uh, Edward Snowden and others who are releasing classified information and publishing it, there's another regulation that people are also ignoring, and that's the Executive Order 13526, which covers all classification of material in, in the U.S. government. Uh, section 1.7 of that says that you cannot classify, maintain classified, or not declassify material if it is evidence of a crime, fraud, waste, abuse, corruption, em embarrassment to a person or an agency, and several other things. But the point is, a lot of the material that was published from Edward Snowden and also from uh, Manning, were, uh, there were ev evidence of a crime. The collateral murder movie was, was uh, a straightforward war crime. I mean, those are crimes that people should be prosecuted for. And, it, and by those regulations that governed classification for the U.S. government, they must be declassified. And so therefore there's no real violation of anybody's right. And besides all the things that have been uh, discussed, I have not seen any damage to their capability to do any kind of intelligence analysis anywhere in the world. I mean, so <clears throat> when they publish stuff that, oh, we're looking at emails and phone calls and so on, well, everybody knew that already. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, there's no surprise to that. They certainly, the terrorists have known that all along. Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that it was kept, the fact that it was being done was kept from the U.S. public because they didn't want the U.S. public to know that they were a part of this spying program. I mean, uh, the idea that they, that they had, don't have the capability to do it is just nonsense. I mean, we had the capability to do that in 1999. All we had to do was have space and power and we could collect everything in the world. There was nothing to limit us to do it. And we had, we had do, done the development to sessionize material up the fiber networks and up in the World Wide Web. And certainly the capacity to tap all the phones was already there. It was not, a, it was just a matter of having space and power and, and equipment to do it. And that was not a problem for us at the time. And it certainly isn't a problem for them now. So all of this is really a fabrication to keep everybody ignorant, uninformed, and just so you'll follow the instructions from those in power. Thank you, Bill. Um, 
I hope you stick around now. I'm going to bring in Sam Husseini, yeah. but in a, in a minute, but I want to read an, a bulletin that just came out uh, to add to the headlines. This is from the Defense Assange campaign, a tweet. It says, three British undercover police have just stopped and demanded ID from one of Mr. Assange's legal team exiting the embassy. At least two <laughs> undercover cars are currently staking out the embassy in shifts, together with police surveillance cameras implanted on opposing buildings. So this is a kind of new uh, ominous development here. That one of uh, The lawyers have always had the right, as far as I understand, even after Ecuador cut off Julian Assange's uh, access to, to visit him. Uh, now they have, <laughs> the British police are demanding ID from part of his legal team. Now, Sam Husseini, Sam, at the beginning, uh, I read some headlines and I finished with your, I uh, read your entire IPA statement in which you quote Barbar's testimony and then Floyd Abrams' response. So tell us about how you know how you came got onto that and what you make of all of that. Um, well, I noticed, you know, what 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 Barr said uh, that basically, um, you know, the nominee for attorney general is basically putting out a line that um, the, the standard should be if it harms the nation, if it hurts the country, that that should somehow be the standard for whether or not a journalist is prosecuted. Um, and I found this an extraordinary statement uh, coming from a, uh, you know, somebody who's coming in to be attorney general. Um, I mean, it's beyond saying, you know, you know, I think it goes beyond some of what we've heard about against WikiLeaks from uh, prior government yeah. officials that they uh, it's classified information um, and they're colluding with people who are breaking the law by you know violating their service of the government and so on, which is, in itself is highly dubious. But it seems to even go beyond that. And I started poking around, and there's very few people were speaking out against this. Uh, WikiLeaks actually did on their Twitter feed, uh, I noticed, and Matt Taibbi uh, did. But other than that, I found a remarkable silence among people with a substantial um, uh, platform. I emailed the Press Freedom Committee that I'm on the uh, you know email list for at the Press Club here. I'm a member of the National Press Club, um, and they didn't seem eager to do it, although a member of the Committee to Protect Journalists noted that they had put out a very mild uh, statement eventually um, on the matter. Um, and um, I got the bright idea actually at the suggestion of uh, Francis Boyle, a very um, a critical, uh, very important law professor uh, at the University of Illinois to uh, perhaps reach out to Floyd Abrams, who I had thought of, but didn't think of actually approaching him. Floyd Abrams is regarded as the leading expert on the First Amendment of the United States. He uh, represented the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers lawsuit. Um, and I was very delighted that he got back to me uh, with the statement um, saying uh, that uh, Barr's comments are deeply threatening to the First Amendment norms in general and journalistic freedom in particular, uh, which I thought was a fairly strong statement. And we put it out on social media where it got a fair amount of pickup. And then I did put out a news release. That's what we do. My day job is with the Institute for Public Accuracy, so we put out critical news releases, hopefully on timely subjects. Um, and um, so we blasted this out literally to thousands upon thousands of media professionals. I, I just did a Google News search um, and nobody's picked it up, which is kind of remarkable. I mean, when uh, several months ago, when um, uh, Floyd Abrams, the same First Amendment scholar, um, weighed in on the side of Acosta, CNN's uh, reporter, when the White House was barring him uh, from going to the White House. It got picked up by tons and tons of media outlets when he we weighed in on that subject. Uh, but here, it's the same person, it's the same definitive authority on the First Amendment, weighing in on the critical factor of a pending nominee for attorney general uh, setting a uh, uh, arguably very uh, onerous standard um, uh, about the First Amendment. It, it has gotten no media pickup. I managed to get the librarian here at the press club to do a nexus search. As of yesterday, nobody's picked it up. She's said she's going to do another one for me. Um, but according to, you know, 
Google News. And of course, that's a biased thing too, because Google gets to pick what, <laughs> what qualifies in its cache of what's news websites and what's not. So uh, that might be a skewed um, uh, realm as well. So it's, you know, I think it's a critical comment, uh, a very dangerous comment from Barr that obviously threatens WikiLeaks and eventually I think will threaten a lot of media outlets who have any intent on doing critical reporting. Um, and it's remarkable that there's media silence about Abrams' critique of it. That was the word unspoken in the testimony. The name uh, Julian Sandra WikiLeaks did not uh, come up at all, did it? But it I sounds like, that. yeah. Go ahead. Sounds like the media re recognizes what he who he was talking about, which is why they haven't touched the story and hasn't appeared anywhere, right? Um, possibly. Uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that that's part of it. I think that the, the sort of personal animus uh, against Assange perhaps leads uh, perhaps some people in corporate media to go along with um, these onerous standards, but you know, you'd think that some of them would realize that, you know, eventually it's going to go beyond that if, if it's allowed. Um, you know, he, he didn't say, you know, well, you know, that there are media outlets and then there are media outlets, or, you know, he, he, he didn't do anything like that. He outright said, if a journalist arms the country, uh, then we might go after them. Yeah. Uh, Sam, I hope you can stick around because I'm going to bring in Ray and, and we, I want to open this up to a, as freewheeling a discussion as possible. Your thoughts, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst and frequent visitor to the vigil. Can't hear you, Ray. You're muted, Ray. Unmute your mic, please. All right. Uh, there you that go. Work now? Yes, it does. My wife often says she'd like me to mute, but... Uh, <laughs> you mean your mouth? You mean... <laughs> okay. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is a good crew, Joe, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts here uh, relevant to what's been said before. Um, one has to ask, you know, why do they hate Julian Assange? Well, there's collateral murder. There's all that stuff from Afghanistan, Iraq, the diplomatic cables. But take it from me, the real reason they hate Julian Assange is because he has this bizarre ability to get leaks still. And that's why they call it, I think, wiki leaks. And what's a leak? <laughs> that's something as Bill Benny has it described, not something you put on the internet, not something you put on the web, or on the, on the network, it's something you download from a computer and you get it to, if not Julian Assange, and one of those lieutenants, okay? So uh, if that's the case, and if, that ha if that's how Julian Assange got not only the Democratic National Committee emails, which let's face it, were pristine, pure documentary evidence, that, that Hillary and the DNC stacked the deck against, um, what's it good old, what's his name? Come on, you guys. Ooh. Bernie Sanders, okay? So, uh, you know, they were, they were damaging. And, you know, I'm the last one to suggest that, uh, that they would not have hurt Hillary Clinton, but they were the truth. So that's one thing. Now, how did Julian Assange get Vault 7? My God, Vault 7. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Vault 7, this is a, uh, an array of computer tools uh, that were developed with NSA, uh, Bill's old friends, and CIA types uh, at, a, at a huge cost. Uh, Vault 7 uh, has 700 million lines of code. Now, I was on my way to an interview one time, and I was going to talk about this, and I had the presence of mind to call Bill Binney. I said, Bill, uh, 700 million lines of code. That, that sounds like a lot, Bill. <laughs> and Bill says, well, yeah. <laughs> he says, Ray, you history majors, I tell you. He says, look, uh, can you still do multiplication? I said, yeah. He says, well, multiply $25 by 700 million 
that's what this program costs, okay? So you're up in the billions. I haven't done the math recently and I forget. Anyhow, that got to Julian Assange. These were the family jewels. Julian announced that this treasure trove was more consequential and more comprehensive than all the stuff Ed Snowden brought out into Hong Kong. That's big. Does Julian exaggerate? I haven't seen him exaggerate this kind of thing. So what happened? Uh, less, well, in March of 2017 is when Julian announced that he had yet another leak from an inside CIA source, whether it was a staffer or whether it was a contractor, we were not sure at the time. I'm still not sure. And he said that this was very damaging because it, it released all these very fancy tools developed by Bill Binney's old folks with the, with the, or developed by CIA with the help of Binney, Binney's old folks who really have the expertise. And the first thing we learned on the 7th of March, 2017, was uh, one of these tools allowed the CIA or someone else to take control of a car and make it go 120 miles an hour and kill somebody. Okay, ooh, that was fancy, that was, that was sexy. And the, the New York Times uh, published that. Same time, there was uh, a tool that allows you to arrange a TV in such a way that you turn it off, but guess what? It's still on. And as you go to bed and whatever you do in your bedroom, uh, everything is recorded. Everything goes back to whoever wanted to load this stuff. Now, here's the point. At the end of March, on the 31st of March, they released a new tool and it was called Marble, Marble Framework actually. And this was a, uh, well, sometimes the, U sometimes the CIA uses uh, 35 cent words. It enabled the CIA to obfuscate, okay? You could hack into a system, hack into a computer or a server and obfuscate who hacked in and make it appear that it was somebody other than you. Now, Bill and I thought, that's pretty curious. Hmm, I wonder. Well, I wonder if that, well, could it be that the breadcrumbs that were left on some of these metadata, could it be that the name of the first chief of the, of the Cheka, the forerunner of the KGB, I uh, always name, um, his name and patronymic, uh, could it be that uh, those breadcrumbs were left not by careless professional Russians, but mm, by John Brennan or Admiral Rogers or this little group, the little group, thousands of people, a whole new directorate set up by John Brennan, head of the CIA five years ago. So this marble framework thing was really poison. So much so that the New York Times looked at it and said, oh my God. Uh, but I talked to the White House, so I talked to the CIA. I said, no, 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 don't publish that. Don't publish that. Anyway, the New York Times didn't publish it after having published the other stuff, okay? Now, uh, fortunately for Washington Post readers, Ellen Nakashima, fairly good journalist, although, you know, anyhow, uh, she didn't get the memo. Uh, she didn't get the word from on high that she was not to write the story of him, so she wrote a terrific headline uh, released by WikiLeaks, uh, Blows Secret uh, uh, CIA Plan to Hack In, okay? So it's out there. She pointed out that they worked in five languages, Russian, Chinese, Persian, um, Arabic, and Korean. So it's not a stretch of the imagination, you know, we historians or we all source analysts like to connect dots, so to speak. And, you know, if you're looking for who might have hacked into the DNC and left these uh, little Brit crumbs, well, you know, uh, Bill uh, can speak for himself, but uh, it's not a leap. It's not a, a, a logical leap to suggest that if it wasn't the Russians, and we're pretty convinced it wasn't, it was somebody with the capability to do this and to obfuscate <laughs> who did it. A little footnote here, uh, the CIA tool had built into it a de-obfuscator, so they could always have the original, okay? Now, why am I saying all that? I'm saying all that because Julian Assange, if he doesn't exaggerate, which he doesn't, 
he's got a pile, a pile of stuff from Vault 7. Uh, he may have released one bombshell, namely Marble Framework, but there's lots more. Now, do I know, do I know that? <laughs> I just know that as an all-source analyst, just looking at, at what he said and what, what, he, what he did so far. Now, Julian, according to a report by a very good reporter, John Solomon, uh, John Solomon told me one time that he looked up to Bob Perry as, as the consummate reporter, investigative journalist. And Bob is good, but John Solomon is equally good. He writes for The Hill. So he came up with the, this uh, information that the CIA was so, so upset about this that they got a lawyer from the Justice Department. His name was Laufman. He was been on the TV lately. His name is Laufman, okay? And they said, look, Justice Department, by the way, does the CIA's bidding on such things. He said, look, talk to Assange's lawyer. Can't we work out something that, you know, where, where Assange could at least... Uh, make sure that really sensitive stuff to get people in trouble or, you know. Uh, so talk to Julian's lawyer. Julian's lawyer talked to him and they say, hey, this is in March, 2017. And they were very close to a deal, um, the two lawyers. And, and, uh, and what Julian said was, you know, I'd like uh, some sort of free passage for this, you know. And besides, I can tell you who, who it was that didn't hack. In other words, you know, this big uh, cost lever, I can tell you who it was that didn't hack. So these naive lawyers, okay, Laufman for the DOJ, I could just see what happened. He's talked to his buddies there in the DOJ and say, oh, wow, you know what? Uh, Senator Warner from Virginia, my senator, uh, he would be very interested in this because he's really interested in Russian hacking. <laughs> and Laufman, I can't believe it. I guess, you know, he, he watches CNN. He gets in touch with Senator Mark Warner. And he says, uh, Senator Warner, uh, we have a deal going here, and we thought you might be interested. And Julian Assange is going to tell us who didn't do it, who didn't hack in. <laughs> and Warner says, oh, that's very well. I'll be back to you. He calls Comey. Comey was still the FBI director. And Comey says, my God. Turn that thing off. Turn those, turn those contacts off. Uh, Warner comes back and tells Laufman, it's off. Don't talk to Julia Assange anymore. <laughs> well, you know, that, it's pretty transparent that, uh, if I have to explain it, of course, that Senator Mark Warner and James Comey had constructed this edifice of the Russia Gate, and if Julian Assange would give us tangible proof that <laughs> Russia didn't do it, that's the last thing they wanted. Now, Julian got really ticked off, according to this report from John Solomon. And he said, all right, that's it. I'm going to release uh, one of the worst. And that was how Marvel Framework came out. Now, I know I'm talking so long, but let me just finish up here. So they hate him for that. And they know he's, I think, they know he's got more. Now, they can't go after him on First Amendment grounds. They can't. I mean, the New York Times is mealy-mouthed, and they don't say anything. But I think one, real, one reason they don't is because they know that this would be a bridge too far to cross. So what's, what's the explanation? And the explanation is they want to get them on espionage. Now, how do they do that? Well, first they write this uh, uh, Lou Carding thing with contribution, a generous contribution from the National uh, Endowment for Democracy. <laughs> That's incredible. That story needs to get out. I hadn't heard that before. And, and then they say, oh, Mark uh, Manafort, Paul Manafort was there three or four times. Uh, and uh, of course, there's no evidence he was, but that sticks, right? That sticks in the public imagination. And then now, if DOJ, it's the FBI, no doubt, is talking to the health Okay, the Ecuadorian uh, people who were hired in the security, I've been there. They know, know who these guys, some of them are private security firms. You know, they can, they can find out things. Oh, just like the CIA found out things from uh, the pe people who, who we you know, either bribed or tortured about, uh, about Saddam Hussein, right? So they can get these people and subordinate them and say, hey, you know, we got a lot of pounds we can give you. If you could just remember, don't you remember Manafort? Here's a picture. Don't you remember seeing him in there? You know, so, so it's so crass. 
That is my idea of what they're trying to do. Bottom line, I don't think there's any chance that uh, they think they get away, even in these circumstances, even with Barr saying the things that he does, with uh, going after Julian Assange for being a publisher. But they can go after if they can construct a case saying he took active measures to get these Russians to give him the stuff and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be tough to do that, but Mueller's hard at work. He's been at it for over a year and a half now. Is he going to come up empty-handed? Is he going to say, well, no, we we can find anything, just like Bob Woodward did after he wrote that book? No, Mueller's not going to do that. So what's Mueller going to do? Uh, he's going to get the proceeds from the interrogations of these helpers at the at the Ecuadorian embassy. And he's going to get some other stuff from the old friends of John Brennan, sort of evidence like weapons of mass destruction, just as reliable. And my view is that there's an even chance that Mueller will construct some kind of case based on falsified information. The only deterrent from that. The only deterrent he has would be if he knew that there were one or two honest lawyers left in the Department of Justice. Now, I hope there are, but I don't know. Uh, Looking lately, I don't know if there are, but if Mueller feels that he can't trust people to be dishonest, (laughs) then this would really string him up bad. So that would be a deterrent. I guess the chances that I weigh them are 50-50, that Mueller will come up with spurious intelligence and say, aha, we got him, uh, collusion, up, up, you know. Uh, or he's going to say, well, uh, we don't have much, but we do have these terrible crimes about commercial fraud and all that kind of stuff. These are all crooks up in New York anyway. Big deal, uh, yawn, yawn. So I've talked enough, but those are my thoughts at present. Thank you. I'll mute yourself, Joe. I'll mute yourself, Joe. Joe, unmute yourself. I'm usually the one giving that instruction. So here we go. I guess I I got it back now. Yeah, the, the other defense could be if he actually, Assange's team, were allowed to have a defense and ask discovery. And if it ever got into a courtroom, this indictment, like Mueller's indictment of the GRU agents will never go into a courtroom. That's why he could say whatever he wants in it. I want to Could open I it up. Something when you get done. Yes. Bill, one second before you do. I just want to read one more quick uh, bullet in here that um, Ecuador's, we just talked before about uh, how one of Assange's lawyers was asked for ID by British police coming out of the embassy. And now we've learned that Ecuador's ambassador to the UK has denied access to Assange today by the Frontline Club founder, Vaughn Smith, celebrated ABC News journalist and former Taliban hostage, Sean Langan, and Ecuador's former consul to the UK, Fidel Navieras, all made applications to see him this week, and the Ecuadorian government said no. So they are allowing some visitors, but not others, including the uh, founder of the Frontline Club, which is kind of like the press club where Sam Husseini is, or just disappeared from, uh, in London. So Bill, please, weigh in. Oh. Yeah, I was going to comment on the uh, on the Mueller indictment that Rosenstein announced. <clears throat> you know, of the <clears throat> excuse me, of the GRU agents, he was indicting them as spies for being spies. But he was using uh, DC leaks and uh, and uh, Lucifer too as the basic founding evidence to look at. Well, we could prove forensically that not only was the Lucifer two data not a hack that went across the Atlantic, we could prove that. We could also prove that he was manipulating the data and therefore fabricating the data. So he used, Rosenstein and Mueller were using fabricated information to concoct an indictment, which is also a fabrication. And so, you know, it's all this false, that's the way they're trying to manipulate evidence or create evidence to to, uh, try to get rid of Trump or anybody that, Julian or anybody that's potentially disruptive to the deep state and the and the uh, shadow government. That's they don't want the truth about anything out there, and so they're 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 doing these kinds of fabrications. And this is the Department of Just Us operating, where it's Mueller, Comey, and all those McCabe and all those people were part of it. 
Yeah, unfortunately, Sam, uh, I'm rather Kevin Zies uh, left us. I wanted to bring him into this discussion, but he did write on the chat panel here before he left that his sense was that if Assange is prosecuted, it will be as an accomplice to leaking classified documents, not for publishing, but for an accomplice to the leak. I think that's what Ray was getting at, where they'd have to prove that he instructed someone to steal a document and then give it to us. And Bob Perry, by the way, wrote about this uh, maybe five, six years ago, in which he talked about how journalists often very much encourage their sources to give them stuff. So where is the line between encouraging a source and finessing them and trying to get them to get that one more extra document, please, that I need so I can really nail down the story and and telling them to commit a crime. So uh, in Assange's case, that might not, that fine distinction might not be so important to the prosecutors. Yes, Ray. Oh, we got Brian Becker in here. Brian, you want to, before we bring Ray back in here, because you did have quite a bit of time on the floor, Ray. If you don't mind, I want to welcome Brian Becker, who's the host of Loud and Clear. Brian, uh, I don't know how much of this conversation you heard, if any, we were talking about uh, some of the headlines that I read at the beginning. Uh, and one of them was that, um, well, first of all, we saw Bob, uh, we have Sam Hosseini here because Sam was able to get Floyd Abrams to weigh in on this extraordinary statement that was made by uh, b- by Barr when, during his testimony to become Attorney General. I'm trying to get it in front of me. Um, he said, Barr, it's one thing to say that there could be circumstances in which the journalists need to protect her. Now, that's Abrams' statement. I'm sorry. Basically, Barr said that uh, I, he could conceive of situations where, you know, as a last resort, where a news organizations run through a red flag, or something like that, and knows that they're putting out stuff that will hurt the country. There could be a situation where someone, a journalist, could be held in contempt. That was an answer to the question by Senator Klobuchar about whether whether the Justice Department would ever jail reporters for doing their jobs. Brian, you want to weigh in on that and uh, anything else about what's going on and how you see the situation of Julian Assange right now? Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I, I didn't hear the earlier conversation. I just came in for the last uh, comments by Bill Binney, but I did see uh, Barr's comments. Uh, and of course, uh, who? what is the red flag? I, I, what's the red line or the red flag and who determines it? I mean, where, wait a second, what, what about the First Amendment? I mean, uh, and we have at the same moment that Bill Barr, the architect of mass incarceration in the United States, someone who loves to put people in prison and lots of them. And as you can see in in his uh, his document that he authored in in 1992, uh, the case for mass incarceration in the United States. I mean, that's who this person is uh, in his testimony he says, yeah, I can see I can see us uh, arresting journalists. Sure. Well, in, a, in fact, uh, uh, Marzea. Uh, Hashimi, the American, African-American woman uh, who was a well-known anchor for the press TV show, The Debate, uh, a show that probably many of us have been on frequently, certainly more than once. She she stopped in L.A. as she does every year on Sunday um, to visit her family in St. Louis and to also make a movie, a documentary about Black Lives Matter in St. Louis. And of course, St. Louis is just a little bit away from from Ferguson, where Mike Brown was killed, that inaugurated the Black Lives Matter movement, she's arrested. And the day after, the FBI says, well, uh, we, we have unspecified charges, or that's what the media was saying. Well, she's not, she doesn't have any charges. She's arrested as a material witness. And we know how Robert Mueller played that after 9-11, where literally thousands of people who were either Arab American or South Asian or Muslims or looked like they were South Asian or looked like they were Arab, uh, they were they were arrested on as material witnesses and thus uh, denied the, all the fundamental rights of an arrestee for an arraignment and to uh, to face their accuser and to know the charges because there actually are no charges. So this is happening right now. This is happening because, of course, Press TV is a target. Uh, Julian Assange is a target for a different reason. Press TV is a target because. It's part of the state media for Iran, and Iran is in the crosshairs of the Trump administration. Uh, Julian is in the crosshairs because he tells the truth. Uh, WikiLeaks has never published anything that's not true. 
And so when you have the attorney general coming in and say, oh, yeah, I can conceive of um, arresting journalists and holding them um, sort of vaguely about red flags and maybe for contempt for maybe other things, you can't but interpret this uh, as a signal of what the mood and temperament of the government is right now. And, and of course, it's not Trump only. It's not Barr only. This is across the board. That's why I think what we're doing here is, in fact, uh, critically important because we are not beholden to either of these parties. Uh, we're not part of that establishment. We're not part of, of these elites. But I think we do speak for the majority of people in the world, and certainly the majority of people who even read uh, about WikiLeaks revelations through, say, The Guardian or The Washington Post or The New York Times, we value this information. Not only do we value it, but we learn about a government that speaks in our name and is committing crimes against humanity, like the crimes that WikiLeaks uh, revealed in the Iraq war logs. Uh, this is indispensable information. So uh, we're, we're up against it right now. We all know we're up against it. Julian Assange is up against it more than anybody. But I actually feel that uh, given the, the time and the mood and the temperament uh, within this country and amongst the law enforcement, uh, that you know, they feel that they, they're untethered. They don't have any restraints right now. Anything goes right now. Uh, all the more reason why what we're doing is, is in fact, critically important. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you for that. Anybody want to weigh in? Just it's a free discussion now. I, I'd like to weigh in briefly just on, you know, th there's the immediate threat against Julian. And I, I'd like to just pull back and see how much this has all cost us, you know, you, you, we talk about the, the cost of the Iraq war, there's the direct cost of the Iraq, something like the Iraq war, the disaster, the humanitarian disaster, the expense and so on. And then there's missed opportunity costs. And them going after uh, WikiLeaks and Julian over the last several years has had such enormous missed opportunity costs. Like they pulled the plug when, when WikiLeaks was most prominent, when they put out the um, uh, the uh, collateral murder videotape and so on, they pulled the plug on their financing. They could have gotten a ton of money at that point. And the, 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 the state led by Joe Lieberman, uh, you know, in cahoots with the credit card companies, pulled the plug on what could have been a groundswell of financing for independent media. And now, you know, they've got him on the legal ropes forever and ever hauled up. You know, Julian, several years ago, quite prophetically, wrote, wrote a book, uh, uh, Google is not what it seems. And I, I suspect, I don't know, I, I'm not in close contact with him as other folks here are. I think he had his eyes set on challenging the internet giants um, uh, of you know, not simply continuing to do incredible work in terms of getting these leaks out, um, but also you know, the very structure of how we communicate um, uh, nationally and globally um, it is now dominated by Google and Facebook and Twitter, uh, a new generation of, of um, monopolies. And I think that WikiLeaks could have been in a position to challenge that in a substantial way. Um, and, you know, that, that, that enormous misopportunity costs has, has been there right now. You know, the independent media, meaningful independent media is, is a bare bones operation, which is part of the reason you've seen the rise of things like RT and press TV and so on that are connected with governments that are sometimes at variance with the U.S. establishment. And it's important that those are there. But, you know, I mean, we saw the dangers of that in, in terms of uh, Al Jazeera. You know, Al Jazeera was supposed to be, you know, the answer. Uh, whatever it was 10 years ago. And, you know, because they are a part of the apparatus of, um, you know, the Qatari regime, there, there are obvious limitations of that. However, you know, important and, you know, um, great some of the journalistic work that comes out of any one of these establishments are. WikiLeaks could have been the, the foundation and could have been a wellspring of financing. Um, for that kind of independent media and I independent social media on a global scale. And, and that opportunity at a critical point in the development of 
the internet and human communications has, has been eviscerated by the actions of the state in going after WikiLeaks when they did. Anyone want to jump in? End of rant. Yeah, we need a new rant. Go ahead, Ray, you're on. <laughs> yeah, we talked uh, before Sam came on, uh, before Brian came on about uh, WikiLeaks and Guccifer 2.0. And um, uh, it was mentioned that uh, uh, the uh, 12 apostles, not 12 apostles, the, the 12 GRU folks that were uh, apparently taken out of the GRU phone book and indicted just like ham sandwiches uh, for, for spying. Uh, uh, they, that was based largely on material from Guccifer 2. And uh, Bill has already pointed out that uh, there's a problem with that. So I'd ask Bill, Bill, do you have any clues as uh, you know who is this Lucifer too? I mean, who is this? Who is this? We're non sexist in in referring to Lucifer too. Whether it's a he, she, or it, what is it, Bill? Do you have any thoughts? Who could it be? <laughs> well, of course, you and I have discussed this, uh, Ray. <clears throat> it, uh, <clears throat> to, 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 if you summed up all the evidence that you can point to as evidence, mm -hmm. that there are uh, telltale signs of who did it in the in the uh, supposedly the shadow broker uh, output or whatever it is, uh, you know, or, uh, and, and, uh, and if you looked at uh, all the fabrication that we can show with Goose for two and some of the stumbling and bumbling and the speed and stuff like that, it's a standard bumbling that people would do when they're not really that talented in, in doing these kinds of things, uh, <laughs> which really smacks like your, uh, your special department down there at CIA. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the whole thing is a fabrication anyway. I just say we should ignore all of that. I mean, but I also wanted to point out one of one of the earlier discussions where we were talking about the, the things, the lost opportunities. Uh, one of the other consequences, and we need to really, uh, you know, it's really being missed by the U.S. public. One of the consequences of the actions that our government took to do, to react to 9-11 is that they've basically done and achieved against our own country what the terrorists wanted to happen, but could never do by themselves. So we have done to ourselves what they wanted done, you know, but th that th they could never achieve. And so we, we've corrupted our own process. We are destroying our own democracy. Our Republic is going down the drain because of the actions of our own government. And, and I believe that the, we should have a, a clean, like if Barr says he doesn't have any problem with uh, putting a lot of people in jail, well, there's a lot of them down there in D.C. who aren't following the law, and there's a lot of them down there who need to go there. And if Barr starts to say that, well, then let him start doing it. Destroying all of that on hype threats and uh, a hype threat of terrorism and certainly a hype threat of Russia. And we've been through that before, haven't we? I mean, yes. it's only natural that if there was a McCarthyism with the first Cold War, there's going to be a McCarthyism with the second Cold War. And that's what we're, we're living through right now. Uh, yeah, and, and Louis and it's not just right at the heart. Of, yes, and and they're lining us up to give more money to the Department of Defense for this Russian military threat. You know, mm -hmm. so this is the whole idea of the new Cold War. It's going to cost a few more trillion dollars, and that was the whole idea. They wanted to swindle it out of the public, keep them stupid and uninformed, so they don't know what's going on, and they'll just follow along like sheep. Who's got the, the whole belt? Idea, that was the whole idea yeah. of the first Cold War. Exactly. Comic Bomber gap, missile gap, all of this found out to be total exaggerations. And, yep. uh, but it made a lot of money for people uh, that Eisenhower warned us about. And they're <clears> making <throat> a lot of money for people today, a, a lot more money than they made then. But there's a new McCarthyism that, as I say, Assange is a key part of that because they have to yep. shut him down. And they're also shutting down alternative media that has been existent before RT or Sputnik or any of the Russian English language media existed. There have been people... Uh, critical of American foreign policy, but suddenly when we, we are writing that kinds of journalists like that are writing the same kind of criticism, we're now somehow puppets of Russia, as if we couldn't have thought of that of ourselves. It's very insulting. So to smear Russia yeah. for any kind of criticism of their actions, the, the rulers and leaders of our country, whether that be economic and the, and the unrest that's growing around the world and including inside the U.S., it's got to be blamed on a foreign power. The yellow vests, of course, were stirred up by Russia. 
all of this nonsense. And uh, there are new um, controls on media. NewsGuard is this organization that's calling alternative media like Mint Press and, and questioning them as if they have subpoena power on behalf of the government. And they're just a private organization, but uh, very much maybe on behalf of the government, who could never do that. You can have the Justice mm -hmm. Department call. Uh, an operation, a small place like Mint Press, start asking them about their finances yeah. and why they do that. So we're in a really horrible uh, environment. Brian or Ray? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to uh, to note something here. I've been throwing away a lot of papers uh, trying to get uh, downsized, and I uncovered uh, some comments by this fellow Robert Mueller, uh, who's been in the news lately. lately. And he was complaining to Congress that if we had this, if we only could have this dragnet surveillance system, uh, maybe 9-11 could have been prevented. Okay, it's Mueller talking about that, knowing full well that NSA did have that stuff, okay, <laughs> and could have prevented it if it weren't for the indignities in the system. Now, what do I, why do I mention that? I think this is a, an aspect that, that Americans need to know and they don't. And uh, I don't know how you do it, but this is what they need to know. 9-11 could have been prevented if WikiLeaks was in up and running in those days. Now, that's a big statement, right? How do I know that? Well, I know that because Colleen Rowley, uh, the division counsel in the Minneapolis Bureau of the, of the FBI, and Bogdan Zakovich. Now, most people don't know. Bogdan Zakovich, it's not a household name, but it should be. He led the red teams, the red teams that, that sought to enter airfields, uh, airports, aircraft with bomb-like substances. He was an FAA super sleuth, and his team was, was crackerjacked. And eight out of 10 times, they completely succeeded in getting whatever bomb-like material they wanted onto these planes. And he was up in arms because he couldn't get his uh, superiors to, to work on it. And, you know, the Israelis, uh, they have doors on the cockpits that cost $187 a door, for God's sake. You know, so he was out of his gourd. He was just as upset, more upset than Colleen Riley. And, uh, of course, when it happened, you know, he was disconsolate. Now, he was asked, Bogdan, if WikiLeaks were in existence then, if you could have leaked that, that information to, to WikiLeaks, do you think that, that, would you have done that? And he said, yeah, for sure I would. And then we asked Colleen, and Colleen talked to her special agents in the Minneapolis division, and there were several that were pulling their hair out because headquarters FBI would not give them permission to even go into Musawi's Computer, for God's sake, you know. And we asked them, well, now, so well, you know, if we were allowed to do that, we'd, we probably would have made an announcement, the whole thing would have been called off because we had one of the guys, one of the pilots, one of the uh, maybe co pilots or reserve pilots. So, would you have gone to WikiLeaks? And these, these people worked together with Colleen and said, yeah, we would have. So, what does it mean? Well, if American, well, actually, they did an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times, and the Los Angeles Times published it. it. The title was something, What If? Okay. So these are two people that were in the, in the trenches. They saw what was coming. They were terribly upset by being dissed by, by the powers that be and uh, would have gone to WikiLeaks. And 9-11 would have, presumably, almost certainly been prevented. So now that's not a hard story to tell. You probably don't need as many words as I just used, but Americans need to know that. And uh, if they knew that, uh, and if they knew that NSA had the information anyway, well, they should be held to pay. Trick, as usual, is to get that into the media in such a way that American people can learn about it, and the just us people will not be able to prevent them from learning about it. That's well, I wonder, I wonder, Ray, if WikiLeaks existed in 2002, early 2003, if the invasion of Iraq may have been delayed somehow by the release of the... I mean, there was one, that was that one memo, the Downing Street memo that was released and talk about uh, uh, painting uh, 
coalition aircraft white to make it look like a UN plane and things yeah. like that. And then, of course, the, the great memo of they were fitting the evidence, they were fitting the evidence to the to the goal, which yeah. was the invasion. The thing, yeah. The but we wonder what we could, could have done the, the intelligence, yeah. Brian, if I could turn attention to what's going on outside the embassy right now. we uh, I don't know if you heard these two bulletins that I announced. One was that a lawyer for Julian Assange leaving the embassy uh, just a few hours ago was stopped and asked for ID by British police. Uh, and there were two uh, unmarked cars there continuing their surveillance, which is something I've not heard of before, uh, is threatening an ominous. And then and on the same day... Uh, there was a request put in because the Ecuadorian government has opened up a window here of visitors. We've had uh, John Pilger going twice to see Julian Assange in the last month. Cassandra Fabax was there. Uh, Angela Richter, a theater director, went to see him. And now uh, the, the founder of the Frontline Club, which is a press club, a media club in London, Vaughn Smith, and an ABC News journalist and former Taliban hostage, Sean Langan, as well as Ecuador's former consul to the UK. I think this would be the reason why, in my opinion. Fidel Navares, he was the head of the consulate uh, while Julian was there, but no longer is because we have this new horrible government in Ecuador. They were all denied the application to see Assange. The three of them were going in, or at least, I don't know if they're going in together, but the three of them were denied that. What does this tell you, Brian, about what's happening around there? Anything? Well, I mean, we... We don't know with specificity. Uh, we do know that we're in a stage now where the the government and the coercive institutions that have power and have authority are using their power and their authority to create a sense of inevitability, a sense that uh, a sense of doom or a sense of gloom based on their inevitable power being the ultimate uh, determiner of the outcome or of the fate of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And I think this is an extremely important uh, element of psychological warfare, uh, which is critically important in, in the powers that be efforts to, to succeed because there's, a, there's an asymmetrical conflict going on in, in the political sense, uh, we, the people who are on this webinar and the people who have been coming together every day and every week and every month over and over and over again, uh, don't command institutional power. We don't have uh, vast resources behind us. We may have public opinion behind us, uh, although public opinion, if it's sympathetic but still passive, isn't that powerful. Uh, if it's sympathetic and mobilized, it can be the power. Uh, so I think what what the what the signals that are being sent right now with the denial of visitors, uh, the stopping of journalists coming out of the embassy, credentialing them, stopping and frisking them essentially in a way, uh, it's an effort to wear the movement down, and again to create this sense of inevitability. Inevitability under these circumstances is our enemy. If the, if the assumption is that all the power rests on one side and thus that power will succeed, then it has the effect of disempowering people who want to do something to make a difference. And that's critically important, the psychological element. And I think the powers that be know well about this because these are power, These are institutional powers that have a great deal of experience in about about how to succeed in public opinion and 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 to manipulate uh, public opinion in a way that makes the possibility of an organized public opinion, which is a great power, uh, seemingly remote. So so yeah, we're, what we're experiencing and what WikiLeaks is experiencing, and what Julian Assange in particular is experiencing is a psychological assault based on applying more and more pressure. And uh, under conditions of more and more pressure, if the pressure is not relieved, or if there isn't a sense of growing momentum of support, uh, it, has, uh, it has 
the, it's designed to have a, a wearing down impact on people. That's why I think that we have to highlight each abuse by the government. Every one of these abuses, including the denial of visitation rights, we have to highlight them. And at the same time, each time we do that, reiterate the fact that we know that behind these abusive tactics is an effort to intimidate us and to make us think that we don't have the power, we, the people meaning, and we have to assert very forcefully that the opposite is true, that we won't be intimidated, that no matter what they do, no matter how many visitors are prevented from visiting, no matter how many times people coming out of the embassy, including journalists, are stopped and treated as if they might be criminals or as if they might be under suspicion, no, no matter how many times these kind of power tactics are used, they won't be effective because we understand them, we reject them, we know that the cause that we're fighting for is a just and righteous cause, and that we do, in fact, have public opinion on our side. The real task, in my mind, the real task is to take the passive public opinion that is generally sympathetic to WikiLeaks and sympathetic to Julian Assange and make it less and less passive. And the way this happens is very dynamic in movement building, I think, because uh, when people, the reason people choose to act, when they decide in all of their busy lives with many, many other responsibilities between work and family and so on and so forth, when they decide to, to make time to make a difference, they do it because they feel that they can make a difference. In other words, the, the sense of hope or the sense of making a difference or the possibility of making the difference is psychologically the key to movement building. Uh, people go into the streets, they do all kinds of courageous things that they wouldn't do otherwise if they, if they believe it'll make a difference. And, and that's why I think uh, we have to, again, expose and highlight each abuse and then reiterate, we know what they're doing, we aren't afraid, we are not intimidated, we're going to keep doing what we are doing. And as we do it, we will be like that proverbial snowball that gains a strength and additional support and additional mass as we do it. So anyway, without knowing specifics, that, that would be my general response. Well, that's a very brilliant and incisive analysis, Brian, as your previous comments were. I just wanted to clarify that it was one of Assange's lawyers that was stopped and asked for an ID, not a journalist, but... Would not be surprised if a journal it happens to a journalist coming out. Uh, uh, the guy who should be stopped and frisk is Luke Harding. But in any case, um, <laughs> I wonder, uh, Kathy, you want to come on to the conversation? Kathy Vogan from Australia. We want that uh, Australian perspective. Are you there? Are you not there? Okay. I'm. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I've just been busting to, to say, and I keep typing it into the chat, that uh, of the three people who were barred today, uh, the one I'm most concerned about and shocked by is uh, Fidel Naves, who was the head of the Ecuadorian embassy from July 2012 to 2018, and who has already made a public statement that the Manafort visits did not happen. So it's interesting that uh, Vaughan Smith and uh, the Australian ABC journalist and Naves were all due to arrive there on the one the same day. I don't know if there was a story. Um, maybe the um, maybe the phone wasn't going to be left at the reception, or the cameras weren't going to be left at the reception. I, I can't speculate on that at all. But what is particularly shocking is that the man who ran the embassy for six years has just been denied entry. His own embassy. Correct. He's, he's a citizen of Ecuador. Is he still working in the Ecuadorian government? Does he have another position? You know? Uh, I don't know whether uh, Fidel has another position. I haven't heard of one. Uh, but, yeah, he, he, he retired or he was retired, uh, re replaced. Um, uh, in May 2018, I believe it was May, May last year, um, and then we we have the the new 
ambassador, who's uh, Marchand, who's a totally different kettle of fish. Well, that is really an extraordinary thing that uh, his own government has barred him from entering his embassy. Even if you were just an average Ecuadorian citizen, that would be something that there would have to be a damn good reason, I would think. <laughs> but he was the man who ran that embassy, was the consul general. And they yeah. don't want him to see Assange. Uh, so this is a big message they're sending here again. I love Brian's analysis there, that it's part of this intimidation uh, and this creating this sense of inevitability that, you know, we opened up the doors for a little while because there were no visitors allowed. Now, I don't know how long that window will stay open. But this guy who ran our embassy and was on Assange's side and supported his asylum there, it can't come in. Nor well, can the, head, the, front, the founder of the Frontline Club. Well, you have this happening. Um, Naves being ba barred from going into the embassy, uh, perhaps at the same time as two journalists, certainly same day. Um, at the same time in Ecuador, today you have uh, the Department of Justice is interviewing six, no less, Ecuadorian diplomats about the Manafort visits. So we yeah, have the guy who's, who yeah. said, no, it never happened, the head. And yeah. I, I thought, well, they, they have to interview Fidel Naves. But, in fact, he's in London trying to see Assange and they won't let him in. So I have to see these two as related because it's all happening on the same day. That's quite and interesting. It's all, all around Manafort. That is very interesting because there's no doubt he would have to be questioned, but... Uh, when these investigators want uh, a certain answer, they uh, they don't ask certain people who give them the answer they don't want. Just like they've never asked, the Mueller's people have never asked Assange uh, or anyone associated with WikiLeaks about the so-called uh, emails going to, to WikiLeaks and who gave them to him. They've never, never been questioned. If they really go into the bottom of this crime, they would have to question WikiLeaks, and they haven't. So if they really want to find out if Manafort really was there that day, they'd have to ask answer the former consul, and they pro uh, will not ask him, and he's being barred from entering his own embassy in London at the same time. As I said earlier, I think it's going to be interesting. If we don't hear anything more about this questioning going on in Quito, then they probably didn't get the answers they wanted. They probably have been told, well, he was not there. And I also brought up at the beginning the fact that uh, the third author of the Luke Harding story that Manafort visited Assange in the embassy, uh, this guy, Valencienzo, has been uh, outed now as having been funded by the NED, the National Endowment of Democracy, with $65,000 to run a website, uh, supposedly investigative journalism website, which was pumping out anti-Korea uh, propaganda, essentially. And he was the, he got a byline in The Guardian, this guy, who was being paid for by the U.S. government. The NED being very well known, of course, around the world for uh, stirring up uh, unrest against governments the U.S. do not do not like and would like to see either undermined or overthrown. It has a long record of that. And as I mentioned, the uh, Washington Post uh, wrote in the 1980s that the NED was doing what the CIA used to do openly, uh, covertly. They're now doing openly. So, uh, yes. I'd like, I like to go back to visitation rights. Uh, I think this yeah. is really important. Uh, I think yeah. Brian is exactly right and Kathy as well in making the case that we need to publicize this. I mean, we need to get this around so people care. I mean, it's really blatant. Uh, when I go back, uh, people aren't as old as I am, but there was a Cardinal, Cardinal Benzenti, right? Okay, now he got free when the uh, brief uh, Hungarian revolution took place in Budapest, okay? But then when the communists came back in, he had to flee to the US embassy, okay? Now, Cardinal Menzenti, under these terrible Hungarian communists, had more privileges and more visitation rights. His, his mother used to come to see him regularly. And can, can Julian's mother come to see him regularly? I don't think so. So this is pretty, pretty heinous, you know? And so not only that, in other, terms, in other words, not only is it necessary to, to highlight and get the story out, but also this, the Bundestag members, that was big. That was three weeks ago, two weeks ago, whatever it was. Uh, they made a statement and they went home. Now, what about parliamentarians from other countries? Uh, that was pretty gutsy of those, Linke, the, the, the left party there in, in, uh, in the Bundestag in Germany. Are there no other parliamentarians that care about Julian Assange? 
I've been writing to my friends in, in Dublin. Uh, why not send some, some people from the Dáil there, the parliament there, uh, to see Julian? In other words, even if they, you know, it's not very expensive to go from Dublin to London, okay? Even if they get there and they can't get in, there's a story there. And I think there should be enough people, members of parliament and of the European parliament, uh, that should try to do that because only that way can there be the publicity that, that uh, Brian talks about as necessary to get people from being lethargic uh, to being activists and caring about these things. Yeah, I'd just like to make reference to the the, the special protocol uh, because it's stated therein and has been enforced in relation to Julian's lawyers that he can only receive visitors during visiting hours. Now, what I believe has happened today is that three visitors who applied earlier in the week have been denied entry during visiting hours. So reminds me of I want, when I wanted to see my dog in quarantine and suddenly they capriciously said, no, you can't see her. And I just walked straight through and, and I said, no, them's not the rules. So I'm not breaking them by walking in to see my dog. <laughs> not that you could do that at the Ecuadorian embassy, but they have actually broken their own rules, um, which have been defended, uh, you know, in terms of um, in terms of the, the the barring of Assange's lawyers before he had to appear in court in Ecuador. I think Joe's just popped off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was very interested in um, in your um, impish discussion about FAT32 uh, data, Ray and William, um, because it's, yeah, I, 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 I'm not quite sure how, how it was worded, if words were chosen carefully, but that's, that, that's interesting news. Um, I mean, it further, yes. further supports that uh, there was no hacking. Yep, that's right. It also it goes along with what Craig Murray was saying and also basically what Julian was saying. So, you know, I didn't find any inconsistency there, but it's basic evidence that people are ignoring. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, how how is it that uh, uh, mainstream news won't pick up your information? Is it? Do you think there's actually a, a bar on it? If it, it's on that yes. list? Of yeah, in fact, yeah, absolutely. Because they don't want to. Because they lose plausible deniability if I'm if I'm allowed to testify in court or in or in uh, Congress. Uh, uh, for example, uh, and I would say I, I I when I testified to the Bundestag the German parliament uh, about this uh, mass spying, uh, the United States government sent representatives over to listen. I mean, they, they came 4,000 miles to hear me testify instead of coming 20 miles up the road. You know, you know what I mean? So <laughs> that's how de they're so, they're so desperate not to get my, whatever I have to say out to anybody because then it would unmask them. It's like it's like they're playing the Wizard of Oz game, you know. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, and I'm just a little Toto going over there pulling the curtain back, you know. <laughs> and they can't have that. That's this. That's this effort to silence the truth or whatever whatever truth there is. They simply don't want it out if it contradicts in any way the narrative they want to spin. Hey, Bill, tell the story about your last day at NSA as you were exiting the, the premises. What they asked you and how you replied. <laughs> oh. They didn't ask me, Ray. I just told them <laughs> when I when I was uh, when I was leaving. Of course, you had to turn in your badge, so I quickly did that, you know. And on the way out the door, I said, "Elvis has left the building." <laughs> and then when I got down at the bottom of the steps, I said, "Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty!" I mean, I I, I was not very quiet about it. I was being very loud, and everybody walking around could hear it, you know. So, but they asked you whether you had classified information with you, didn't they? Oh no, they 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 search you if you left. At least that's what they did in art. But this guy Martin, obviously, you know, who took all the uh, the uh, uh, all that uh, data out from the spying group in NSA. I mean, he had you know he had you know large amounts of hard copy data and all kinds of things you'd have to tote and physically remove. Well, they're supposed to be searching these people. 
when I was there, that we got searched, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, what, you know, the thing is, the place has really disintegrated when they, they've outsourced everything. And so, you know, hey, outsourcing, you know, uh, you know. Didn't you, <laughs> they, tell they, them that the, didn't you tell them that you had a lot of classified information right oh, yeah, here? Well, yeah, I, I mean, you know, of course, they, I, I said uh, you can't take anything out. I said, well, I understood that, but I still had my brain. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad they let you keep that. In your memory. Know, there's a question here from a, a, a viewer. Addressed to you, Bill. Uh, yeah. Martin O'Connor asks, how long would it take to transfer DNC data to a thumb drive in that particular uh, case? To a thumb drive? Uh, yeah. Probably uh, a minute. Maybe. All of the emails, the entire email database of the DNC could be transferred to a thumb drive in a minute? Oh, yeah, it could go down at, uh, you know, uh, 40, 40, where the highest we got for the down rate for the yeah. Goose for Two stuff could be handled by a, a thumb drive, and that was 49.1 megabytes. Per, per second that are <clears throat> uh, that 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 means that it could go uh, 49.1 million characters okay so uh, getting that thumbnail out of drive out of the DNC would not be as difficult as getting a piece of paper out of the D, uh, NSA no, as we just no. <laughs> no. I mean that's basically how a lot of this is done you know just put it on a small, a uh, thumb drive or something like that that could be easily hidden. Yeah, and our viewers should understand um, that that is possible across the internet, is it? Yeah. So that's the bottom line of the of the forensic evidence that it was copied, leaked. In yeah, well, we tried. You know, we of course tried to to transfer it across the Atlantic to Europe in various places, the in London and Amsterdam and in Belgrade and also in Albania and everything we went further and further east we went, the harder, I mean, the less capability there was. So, you know, what do you mean by, who do you mean by we, Bill, when you said we, uh, um, this is I, I, I recruited uh, one of the senior hackers in Europe <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and our people, I mean, I said, you want to help us do this little test? And he said, sure. So, and he travels around Europe giving talks. So, you know, he did the testing from trying to pull it across. And I, you know, one of the guys that uh, in the BIPs group was joining us in the discussion. He he said, "Hey, I could set up the database or the data set, and you can try to pull it across." So he set it up over here, and my my hacker friend went around uh, Europe trying to pull it across, and it and didn't could. work. And the amount of data that was actually, being he, actually yeah. <clears throat> actually I actually think I had the formula for the no amount of data that the service providers will allow any one person to to transfer across the net at any given time that's so they don't you know if they if, if for example i put a, a gigabit per minute out there to try to transfer it you know uh, that would take up a, a quite a bit of bandwidth so they 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 have a limit on what they'll allow so that no one can monopolize the band and so i think i have that formula it's like 8.8 uh, megabytes per second for every 100 megabit uh, that you own. So in other words, for a 100 megabit line, we got 0.8 megabytes going across per second. And for 200 megabit line, we got 1.6 megabits going, megabytes going across. And for a, what I calculated to be a 1.5 gigabit line, we got 12 megabytes per second. And if you work it out, well, well for gonna, every 100 megabits, it's 0.8 megabytes. I'm going to interrupt you for a second, Bill, because Brian has to go. I just want to give him a oh, chance. Okay. To give a final word, but I hope you can stick around, Bill, and we go back to sure. the chapter. <clears throat> Brian. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to interrupt Bill. It's always like so uh, fascinating to actually hear from people who know what they're talking about. It's so, <laughs> so unusual. Um, I, I do want to say, in my, in, I, I have to run because I'm going to another meeting on a different issue right now, but I do want to say this that. I, I think that um, all of us have to think now, and I know many of the people who are the really core organizers here have already been thinking and have been planning and and working stuff out. But for us to, um, in the coming, maybe not days, but certainly within the next few weeks, to have some coordinated offline, real life um, sort of manifestations of support and solidarity that even if they're not large in any one place that we have them all over the place 
I, I think that, um, like I'm, I'm with the Answer Coalition, uh, we have, you know, chapters in about 40 cities. Uh, some of them are big cities and some of them are big chapters. Many are small. It doesn't really matter. We know that if if the people who, who really believe in what WikiLeaks is doing and are absolutely outraged by the mistreatment, the arbitrary detention that Julian Assange is facing, this this sort of all out assault, if we can... If we can give uh, everybody who wants to do something a way to do something in a coordinated way so that we can say, for instance, look, on such and such a day, uh, people in 200 cities all around the world did something uh, in a, with a unified message uh, calling for the freedom for Julian Assange to stop the war against Julian Assange and whistleblowers. Um, I just really believe the time is now because I, I think we will succeed with it. And certainly from the point of view of the Answer Coalition, we would do our part to spread the word, to notify our organizers and activists and volunteers from around the country. Uh, and I think people would be more than happy to do it. So just something to think about as we as we keep planning. I think the online vigils are amazing because it's such a it gives such an opportunity for people to really hear such a wide, uh, diverse uh, grouping of voices of people who, like Bill Binney, actually know what they're talking about. I think it's like extremely meaningful. And if we can sort of amplify it with an off, uh, offline sort of street presence sometime soon, I think, I think it would be great. And certainly, again, we would do our part to help out. Well, that's great, Brian. Uh, absolutely uh, wonderful words. And thank you for joining us tonight and giving us some time. Okay. My Hope pleasure. you come back again sometime soon. Okay. Will do. Thanks. Okay, bye. So, Kathy Wogan has one event in Sydney coming up. Why don't you talk about that, Kathy? Uh, okay, here I go. I'll just share the screen. I will share the sound just in case. Oh, we're going to have All a... All right. A all right, folks, here we go. Uh, so <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, events all over the world, uh, we're going to do our second big night live to air in Sydney. Um, this one's a sort of a wider topic. The last one was called The Gagging of Julian Assange. And we had Christine Assange, Julian's mother, um, and Susie Dawson. This time we have uh, uh, Joe Lauria, from Consortium News, Who? we have Who? Joe oh. Loria oh. himself. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, uh, we have Caitlin Johnson, who's one of our favourite independent journalists, rogue journalists, and and bogan socialist. She calls herself. We have Tony Kevin, who's the former am Australian ambassador, who came out recently in support of Julian Assange and uh, has been very vocal in criticising our, our government about trading arms with uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and we have uh, James Cogan, who was supposed to come last time but couldn't make it, who spoke alongside John Pilger in Sydney. Um, he's from the Socialist Equality Party and they, they organised uh, Pilger's talk uh, in Sydney. Now, for this one, I said it was a bit of a wider topic because... That second line there, the future of democracy, is what I want people to think about. I want people to uh, kind of, you know, briefing on the talking notes a little bit, um, but to get people to think about the long term. Uh, where are we moving? Where are we moving in the, um, after all this digital disruption, where are we moving through the 21st century with democracy? Is it going to be direct? Um, as the French uh, Gilets Jaunes um, are calling for with um, an alleged 70% 70, 70 uh, support from the French population. Will France be the beacon that leads us to direct democracy? And if we get direct democracy, would could or would that ever come with the right to make informed decisions? And in that case, there would have to be a place for WikiLeaks uh, in that future. So it's a roundabout way, but a wider discussion and a, an invitation 
to look at the wider perspective and the place of WikiLeaks in the world and uh, the importance of um, First Amendment, of course, but as a vehicle for the delivery, safe delivery of truth. Okay, so that's it. That's my plan. Well, thank you, Kathy. And thank you for using the actual logo from Consortium News on there. That's great. We're joined by uh, Cassandra Fairbanks from Washington. Hello, Cassandra. Are you unmuted? Hey, how are you? You're unmuted. Sorry, I'm on my phone again. So That's you okay. You didn't have to tell us. It's very clear. But uh, we were talking before about these two uh, incidents today outside the embassy. Do you know about them? That one yeah. of uh, Assange's lawyers, when he was exiting, was stopped by British police uh, and undercover, apparently, and demanded ID to show his ID. And there were two surveillance cars there, or two uh, unmarked cars, uh, parked there with this undercover British police officer. And then uh, at some time, I think after that, three journalists coming out, uh, I'm sorry, had applied for, um, had applied for uh, permission to see Assange. Not only three journalists, and that was uh, Vaughn Smith, who's the founder of the Frontline Club, which maybe you visited when you were in London. It's a media club, pretty much like the press club here in Washington. And then as ABC, uh, Australian Broadcasting Cor uh, Corporation journalist, who was a hostage of the Taliban, Sean Langan, were denied uh, permission to see Assange. But more interestingly, as Kathy has pointed out, is that Ecuador's former consul to the UK, Fidel Narvez, who was indeed the guy who ran the embassy for the year, early years of Assange being there, he was denied entry into his own embassy today by the Ecuadorian government. He's still an Ecuadorian citizen. He may even still be working in the government somewhere, and they wouldn't let him in his own embassy. Uh, I just want to know your reaction to that. If you'd just been there to see Julian a couple of weeks ago. I knew that they had been denied. I didn't hear about his lawyer being stopped. That's insane. Um, And they were having an interesting chat when we lost, unfortunately, our connections in various parts of the world. So we apologize for that. We're now under uh, part two in a different URL, which I'm right now trying to post on Consortium News. So if Bill and Cassandra could uh, ad lib a little bit, I'd love it right now. <laughs> and Bill has to unmute himself, however. Sorry. What I'm were you guys to... talking about no. before? <laughs> <laughs> She's going insane right now. Um... Sorry. What were you talking about? I remember we what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, well, what was going on outside the weird people outside the embassy? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. And the mass incarceration <laughs> that Bill was oh, yeah. asking. We, we Let's that say if I say that again, if we lose the line, then we know for sure that was something uh, fishy. Yeah, yeah. Bill well, was I mean, talking like about uh, but Attorney General elect or uh, nominee. William Barr had written a book some years ago, Bill pointed out, about mass incarceration in the United States. And Bill recommends that if he becomes attorney general, that he indeed carries out that mass incarceration, but not of the public, but what he calls the country. In other words, certain people who make decisions in this country. Isn't that right, Bill? Yeah, most of them within the beltway around D.C., yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just but inside. A lot of them go home, you know, they, a lot of them go, to, go back home to hear from their constituents. You know, so, so uh, I, but yeah, I, you know, they need to be looked at and exposed for what they're doing. Like, for example, some of them, you know, it's, it's uh, from the Snowden material, it's pretty clear. If you look just at something called a Fairview program, you could see the tap points of, of, on, on the fiber network all throughout the United States, not just along the coast where they get the foreigners, but right across the country where they get all the U.S. citizens. Well, I mean, even uh, uh, Representative Gowdy was when he was on TV with me. And, uh, he followed me once and said he he didn't believe or his understanding of the of the collection was that it wasn't against U.S. citizens. Well, but he's not asking what are they? He's not asking the question about what are they collecting in in Milwaukee or or in Nashville, Tennessee, or or Dallas, Texas. You know what what are you collecting there? It's not foreigners. The foreigners are on the 
where the transoceanic cables surface. That's on the coast. If you're there, which they are, then they get all the foreigners. Well, what are you doing inside the country then? Well, you're collecting U.S. citizens. And it makes it clear that everything they've been saying about that is a lie. And so they don't ask those questions because then there wouldn't have this plausible deniability and, and make it look like they're, trying, they're conforming with the law and the Constitution, which they're not. That's, that was what we were talking about, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's why we need this investigation of everybody within the D.C. Beltway. And also, when they're, if they're not there currently, they're at home when they come back, investigate them. You know, get them in to testify. Well, there are a lot of people when did you know it, you know? <laughs> uh, There are some innocent people living inside the Beltway, including myself. It's only about a mile or two south of me. But I'm yeah, inside it. Yeah. Uh, no, well, I, mean, I mean, we're joking, right? We're joking, Bill, and yeah. Bill was joking before. Well, we look, look at the U.S. government did that after in, in World War II with the Japanese, right? So the we Japanese should do it with the members of Congress. Citizen. Members of Congress and about 2,000 people in the agencies going down to a certain level of management that are, in your view, responsible. That yes. would lead. I would be an enormous feeling of freedom in the country that would go across the land, but how long would it last until other people took over those actually, positions? And I actually, and I had a solution to that too. <laughs> I, I had a solution to this, to who takes over. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, all in, it's all a part of the article five of the constitution. We have a separate state's constitutional convention with no one from DC. And we changed the convention by having 75% of the states represented, which we could do and ratify it at the same time. And then we implement it by saying, here's how we're electing people who to take positions in government in DC. And we do it by uh, 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 basically a random selection from the voter list. And, and don't, and I'll write the algorithm if you want, but uh, just do it randomly and have just random people go in for these positions and not have that, look at the benefits. We'd have a bunch of people who want to balance a budget. We don't have that now. We'd have a bunch of people who don't like wars and wouldn't want to get in because their sons and daughters would have to fight it. Now, we don't have that now. We'd get a bunch of people who would want to work together to solve a problem. We certainly don't have that now. We'd get rid of all the political parties and all the crap that goes with them, all the lobbying, <laughs> all that would end. I mean, you know, look at all the benefits. So That's I think why it's never right. Changing why how we never. get people in D.C., Get, get rid of the elections and all that, all at once. One fell swoop, we're, in, we're clean, cleansing our government. Is there any way we can get Trump to nominate you for attorney general instead? Because I don't see it <laughs> happening otherwise. Uh, I mean, I would have followed the law right away. Anybody who violated the law, you'd get an indictment on them. You know, submit them for the grand jury to, to, for an indictment. I mean, that's what you do. You follow the law or you don't. Right now, we don't. I mean, except... Uh, we uh, those who are part of the Department of Just Us don't get don't get looked at for the law. Everybody else does. And then you'd that's have how, some. You might have I mean, certain visitors. You might Go have ahead. certain visitors to your house again and be surprised as you're exiting the shower. Um, that's all right. I'm backed up nine ways to Sunday in four different countries. I don't keep everything inside the United States because they'll, you know, I keep it outside the jurisdiction of the United States also. So I've gone well, back up over there. Okay. You're on, you know, we are, we're live being broadcast right now. So I just want to remind you of that. I know you're taping, uh, right? No, we're broadcasting again. Oh, we are. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. So that was, that's that just good. went out. I, I want them to know everything I have to say. <laughs> I and to know what absolutely nothing. I encrypt absolutely nothing because I want them to know everything I think and say. So and far, they do anyway. They do anyway because of the tap that they have on your phone. You said the lousy tap, so they do know everything. Yeah, if sure. You're thinking and saying. No, no, I want them to. I want them to know everything I think of them. After all, I've got evidence of malicious prosecution on their part. That's why they've left us alone. Yeah. Bill's referring, of course, to a long, long case in which uh, he and a few other members of the NSA were never formally arrested, as far as I understand, <clears throat> were intimidated by uh, FBI showing up at their homes. 
because uh, all over basically a program that they'd favored that the NSA did not want and they wanted a more expensive one didn't work as well. Uh, and they made a complaint to the inspector general, right? At the Pentagon. That was our duty we, to do that. The NSA, your duty to do that. Yeah. That was the way they responded. Send the yep. FBI. Now, if we get, also, with, you know, we've been talking about. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But also they tried to indict us three separate times. Each time I had the exculpatory data on that because they thought they took it all. But, you know, I share everything. So I got it back rather quickly, like the next day. So, so, uh, and then the, our, they, the final time, the third time that they told our lawyer, we had a lawyer at the time, Kirk Weeby and I, and he told us that the, the, uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney at the Department of Justice had told him that they were about to indict us. They were coming after us. So I had all this evidence of, uh, of uh, exculpatory evidence and actually evidence to contradict what they were saying, which meant that they were maliciously attempting to prosecute us. That's a felony also. And so I told them uh, directly through a tap that the FBI had on Tom Drake, <laughs> which I knew he had. So I told them over the phone all the evidence I had on the F on the FBI and the Department of Justice, and uh, and all that all that uh, the material that could prove malicious prosecution on their part. And I said, Tom, tell your lawyer that when we go to court for this, we're going to charge them with that and give the evidence to the court. Well, after that, I never heard anything again from them except to get a letter of immunity from them a month later, unsolicited. I know our lawyer didn't understand what happened. I never told him that I was threatening them separately. And so he never knew that. But, uh, but, you know, it just shows you what kind of cowards they are. That's all. They're just cowards. They'll try to do everything they can in secret. And as long as they can they'll get a, and get away with it, they'll do it. When you challenge them in the open, they run. It shows you what kind of country we're living in now as well. Yeah. That right. They will send law enforcement against senior officials of the National Security Agency because you complained about something, which, as you said, was your duty to do. Yes. Uh, it's written in the regulations. It's, yeah, it's the country that wants to take a journalist from his uh, refuge in an embassy in London and put him in it's a courtroom here in Alexandria that it, where he's never going to get a fair, fair trial. Well, it's the same. It's like silencing the truth. Now, the problem is that this, these truths coming for forward show show uh, problems with government and problems with the things in the government. And if they don't ever face them or, or address them, they'll never fix them. And so they'll just keep perpetually festering and, and uh, corrupt and corrupting government all along and never change. So, I mean, it's like if it's like an alcoholic. If you can't see that you're an alcoholic or admit it, you can't fix it. Well, right. that's what they're doing by doing this, by silencing people and stepping on them and stuff like that. That's that's avoiding the issue and not and not admitting you have a problem and don't face it. And so you never well, fix it. You say they're cowards, but I think they're legitimately fear, fearful of the public rebelling against them yeah. when they get when the public is given the information about what these guys <laughs> and some women are really doing in positions of power. And that's WikiLeaks. Yeah. That's why yeah. <laughs> it's like they're that's doing right. the job journalism is supposed to be doing. If journalism had been doing its job all along, we have right. a lot of the situation. We may have never had a need for WikiLeaks either because government officials could go to a trustworthy <clears> reporter <throat> and who has editors who are going to back him and they would publish this stuff. It's happened from time to time. But the media has become so corrupt in, in the service of the state rather than the public that well, WikiLeaks became necessary. <clears throat> and that's why we're talking here tonight. Yeah, the but, uh, guy yeah. who started it, who they want yeah. to prosecute. But actually, yes, for decades, the CIA has been infiltrating and, and trying to infiltrate um, uh, media all along. They've been doing that for decades. Casey was one who said that uh, when, uh, uh, when you, when you uh, know that uh, when you find out that 70 percent of what's being believed by the people in the country and talked about in media, you'll know that we've succeeded. So he's saying, basically, when we can get everybody to believe what something that's false, we've got control of them. That's what I testified to the Bundestag and, and you know, and to the House of Lords in the UK, uh, is that this whole program is nothing more than how their government is trying to take over and have population control of everybody. I mean, uh, that's why I also said that uh, And when Reagan was president, he said, we're a, we're a country with a government. Now I say we're a government with a country. That's yeah. that's what our government has become. Absolutely, I've they heard that case 
court before, Bill. Do you know in what context Casey said that? Was that off the cuff or in a, in a memoir? Or how did that ever get out that he said something so frank as that? You know? Uh, no, I don't. Rem- I don't. I don't know. But I, you know, I do because know that it really <laughs> it sums it up pretty well right yeah. there. Yeah. And we've got sycophantic uh, journalists who are living through. You know, they like to be close to power uh, instead That's of close right. to the people serving the public. So they well, suck we're up. just finding out what the truth is. That's all. I mean, I look at it just finding the truth. I mean, that's that's certainly something we got from Julian, but cer- not something we get from any very very few other people. That's the problem, isn't it? That is the issue right there. That they're protecting, uh, and of course, when government officials talk about freedom of the press and protecting journalists and committee, even organizations that can, they. doesn't protect them they are not going to protect they want to prosecute yeah. um, we've come to a very chilling moment in American history really and not that we haven't been here before we had the first mm. Cold War and the first McCarthyism there have been other going back to witch hunts in Puritan days uh, which is why uh, uh, the playwright Ed Miller uh, compared McCarthyism to the witch hunts of the Puritan days in the crucible his play the crucible so we've got this moment again. It seems to ebb and flow, but this, uh, with the technology that has grown, you know, yep. it's much more ferociously. They have much more ability to control us than they did in the first McCarthy period. Yeah, I, I basically, no. I, I basically agreed with uh, Diane Rourke, and when she said that uh, this is probably the <clears throat> the greatest threat to our our republic since the Civil War. And we don't even know it. And most people don't even know it. That's how successful yeah. Casey, uh, what Casey's it, saying. That's exactly right. Public doesn't that's even exactly know. Right. In, in fact, I would point to Tom Drake. I would say point to Tom Drake when he was uh, visiting uh, or over for a conference in, in Germany. And he told me that uh, after the talk that he gave there, he was approached by an elderly German couple. And they told him, they said, <clears throat> you know, we are uh, an ex-fascist uh, state, and we know it. And you're a pre-fascist state, and you don't know it. That also captures it. That's a very successful uh, job on the part of uh, people in power, to keep yeah. the people who they're controlling from even understanding that there's that's control. Right. But well, I think there is. It. There is. The, some understand, Cassandra, you could jump in, of course, anytime, that there is an understanding amongst people mm-hmm. across the land that things aren't right. There's something wrong in this country. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. don't feel free. And of course, beside the economic pain that's being inflicted by 30 years of this uh, new laissez faire where the government is taken out, no regulation, deregulation, uh, ending welfare <laughs> programs, just transferring wealth from the people to the 1%. So there's anger growing across the United States. There is certainly anger in France. Across the world, I think. Better tradition in France of showing that anger that we do here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that's why I think rulers are scared. And they, they're they moving. they got to silence somebody like Julian Assange. they got to silence yep. WikiLeaks. Because he's, keep, right. he's putting out the, opening people's eyes. And that's why they're going to whistleblowers, too. Don't forget the whistleblowers. Oh, I won't. Yeah. But with their own words, by the way, because it's the documents that are being published or the documents from government. That's so right. they're hanging themselves. So he, they're being hung by their own words through the agency of WikiLeaks and the whistleblowers yep. who risk their lives and their freedom absolutely to do that. And that's a huge, huge step to take, as you know, as any whistleblower. Yep. Know, someone who's not been a whistleblower does can't fully understand. Uh, it's not just losing your job, too, when you're dealing with things like the National Security Agency or the CIA. We're talking about losing potentially your freedom, as we saw happen to Chelsea Manning, of course, and to John yeah. Kiriakou. <clears throat> the only person who went to jail for, CIA, uh, for related CIA torturing was the man who John revealed Kiriakou. that. Yep. The What's that tell crime. you about our country? Instead of putting people who commit uh, you know, the crimes of uh, torture, instead of putting them in jail, we put the fellow who exposes them in jail. Tells they you give a lot. The torturers immunity. We give them immunity. Well, we got to move forward. You know, that's, we want to look forward, don't we, Bill? That's what Obama said. We don't want to look back at the, you can't look back. the last administration. But again, if you can't look back, you can't recognize what you are and what problems you have, and you can't fix them. That's the point. 
So well, unless you hold they, people accountable, you can't yeah. fix any. Oh, absolutely. But maybe they do recognize who they are, and they don't want the, the following administration to look back on their crimes. So they want to have carte blanche to do what they need to do. And the <clears> bigger <throat> example than even Kuriakos is Manning, because she revealed yeah. war crimes, as you said earlier in this broadcast. Yep. That's and right. then who went to jail? The, the pilots, the commanding officers, the people responsible for those war crimes that you could see in black and white, literally? No, yep. the person who revealed them. The yeah, and also who, all those people involved in that stuff are, are the ones making all the money for this military industrial complex and so on. And so yep. I, that's why I called it the happiness management program. You know? When it comes down to, it always comes down to our money in America, it seems like, doesn't it? That is the yep. bottom line. Yep. The business of America. Well, Bill, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, uh, we were hoping that Cynthia McKinney would join us from Bangladesh, but I don't know if that's happened and if that will happen. Um, so I think we might end the broadcast early, uh, if that's okay with our technical people. Um, if, if we doesn't seem like Cynthia's coming in, and uh, I think maybe Bill and I are all talked out. What do you think, Bill? You have anything else to add? <laughs> Well, let's see. Oh, sure. All the Go all ahead. the people in the Department of Justice, including including Mueller, who use the uh, NSA collected data to do to, to, for common crime inside the United States, looking at content and metadata, doing investigating for common crime, and they go use that as the basis for arresting them inside the country. This is for common crime, like drug smuggling or drug drug right. pushing stuff like that. And then they take them to court and they have to do a parallel construction because the NSA data is not admissible in the court. So then they do a parallel construction and say that's the data that they used to arrest them when it was false. That's perjury. So they're perjuring themselves in court and fabricating data, evidence against them. A a instead of using them, denying them also, the use of violating the Fifth Amendment to, of, of testifying against yourself and violating the Sixth Amendment, not allowing them due process to challenge discovery of data used against them in the court of law, in the criminal court. So, <clears throat> and then uh, having Feinstein set up there when she would, Senator Feinstein, when she was uh, trying to uh, uh, assert the value of the program, the domestic spying program, still or when, um, he sa she said that uh, she they, they had used it to put hundreds of people in jail every year. Well, I mean, you know, it's thousands of people in jail since 2001 who've been put there by perjury by the U.S. government. And this is the this is policy of the Department of Justice and the Drug Enforcement Administration and the FBI, that when you do this, you can't file any com any paperwork or any affidavits and mentioning it in the court of law. You have, to do, you have to do this parallel construction and hide the real source of the information that you use to, do, to arrest people. This is the fundamental destruction of our entire judicial system. Not only that, it spreads around the world through the Mutual Law Enforcement Act Treaty, through the uh, uh, embassy representatives, where they pass this kind of information around the world to collaborating uh, policing organizations, like everybody in the world cooperating with the FBI or the DEA. They can, they're can they eligible to get this information too, but not the data. They can't give them the NSA collection. They can just tell them what to do with at a certain time, where to go, who to arrest, things like that. So it's destroying, is, it's destroying democracy around the world, really. Now, how many instances or cases do you know of where that parallel construction was actually employed? Is it widespread or a number of cases? Yeah, or? it is, yes. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, they used it against the Tea Party. They used it against different people, you know, the Occupy group. They used it against uh, Elliot Spitzer, you know, the G Jim Risen, Jim Rosen, it's, the Associated Press. You know, they used it against us whistleblowers. So, you know, it's not just that, but when you get into these hundreds of people every year being put in jail with this information for common crime inside the United States, they're not terrorists, right? Not foreigners. These are U.S. people because from the collection through the Stellar Wind program, the domestic collection inside the United States of domestic communications. I mean, how, no. else, can, how else can the analysts at NSA do love intelligence, you know, look into the data to see if they're lovers who are, who are local, I would point out. Are, are actually cheating on them with other people who are also local. So that means that they're looking at local to local communications. That's inside the United States. And presumably it's supposed to be illegal. Um, uh, well, it is. And, yeah, it's illegal. And what also is illegal, you very well explained, is that you cannot take 
uh, NSA data about local people and use it in a criminal case. But they've found a way around that, haven't they? By, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's Making parallel it. construction. Yeah. By the way, uh, Ray McGovern asked uh, Mueller after one of his talks whether or not he had a problem with parallel construction. And Mueller said, absolutely not. That's because... Uh -huh. Mueller, in his in his own in his statements that he made to Bart Gelman, his interview with him in 2011, it got published in Time Magazine or not uh, uh, yet yeah, Time Magazine, I believe it was. It was uh, <clears throat> he had been he and the FBI had been using the Stellar Wind program since 2001. Well, that means that he'd been doing these prosecutions and and arresting people since that period of time using the domestic collection done by NSA. It's a very optimistic way to end our show tonight. So I'm going to uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you, Bill. Oh, you're thank welcome. Thank you, Ray McGovern. Thank you, David Swanson. David, uh, thank you, Brian Becker. Thank you, Cassandra Fairbanks. Kathy Vogan. I just came back online again. And, uh, <laughs> I, just I, wanna, yes? I, I just want to interrupt you because I, I heard that Susie Dawson I'm just, just about to do that, Kathy. Oh, great. Don't worry. Oh, I don't want to miss uh, that one. <laughs> just thanking everybody. And I was now going to give a plug to an article to by Susie Dawson, who's started these vigils and has done such a tremendous job building this up. And I'm really uh, pleased and honored in a way that she asked me to carry on what she started. She's written an article that is going to be published within about an hour or so after this program ends, which is five minutes from now. Uh, that will be appearing on Consortium News. It's become an exclusive to Consortium News. It is new uh, evidence from WikiLeaks publications that show, I'm not going to give it away, I'm only going to tease it, but it shows some uh, way that New Zealand has been working in the Five Eyes system, Britain, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the five Anglo-Saxon countries, how they share intelligence, mostly for the benefit of the United States, of course, she has new revelations about how uh, New Zealand uh, human intelligence was used to help the United States in a third country. That's all I'm going to say right now. Not in New Zealand, not in the U.S., <laughs> but in a third country, not one of the five eyes, by the way. <laughs> so a non-five eye country was spied on uh, for the benefit of the new United States by uh, New Zealand intelligence agents. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, oh, yeah, there's Ed Snowden revelations, too, I'm reminded, not just WikiLeaks. Get, let Ed get away. Uh, can't let Ed not get his credit. But anyway, <laughs> if you'll read the article, you'll see all that. So it just has to be uh, set up for publication, and hopefully by about uh, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the U.S., it'll be published on Consortium News. And with that, I'm going to say good night, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and watch our Broadcast, sorry again about the technical problem when we lost our stream for a little while there. But uh, we finished it with a flourish, I think, with Bill. Uh, and I thank you. And I thank everyone else who came on board. Right. Good yeah, night. Thanks. Great. Good night. Bye-bye, Bill. Bye-bye.